Let's see here. Now, did they get sworn in at town hall? Maybe that. Oh, I did. Oh, yeah, did. I, yeah, we did. Okay. Okay. We did. Well, I thought that she was going to swear you guys in here. That's why I was like, is she here? But she must have just been <laughs> like, you know what? I'm just going to do it right now. So welcome, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Um, I didn't realize that because I figured we could have the swearing in and then go from there. But i um, glad to have you guys on here. If you want to take a minute to say anything, because we do have a little introduction as well later. But go ahead. <laughs> no, hey, thanks for having us. Um, yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we can do this later. We can, you know. That's fine. Whatever you guys want to say or do, but I just wanted to make sure that you guys were ready to go for the meeting. And that's why I was like, first thing, we got to get that <laughs> situated. <laughs> I think we're ready to go. That's, yeah. I'm looking forward to working with everyone. Thank you so much. Perfect. Okay. Um, approval of the agenda. I don't believe that there's, I think we have everything that we have and then we're good to go with that. Um, approval of minutes. I will entertain a motion to approve. Ashley, I'm sorry, this is Dana. I had my hand up. Oh. Um, I don't know if H4, I'd like to make a motion that we move H4 to H1, board action with respect to the new members, just specifically because I think before we do any board business that we should just do any action in respect to the board members that we need to do before we go into board business. I don't believe there was any action. The only action that we thought was going to be the swearing in portion. Um, that's why, because when Dr. Willow first initially had this come out, it didn't have that first set of that A to the board action part. And that's why I asked him about that. And he resent it out. Um, yeah. That's why sure. I emailed about what H4 was going to entail because some, I mean, e either way, it's still H4. So whatever we are doing with H4, whether it's just a clerical thing or what have you, I think we should still move it to H1 and handle I mean, any board action in regards to the members before we actually do any other board business. Right, I mean, H, uh, H4 is an official, just a, it's a recognition of those new board members so that, so that people that are tuning in, you know, did have a, an official uh, introduction recognition of, of them. Um, in terms of moving it to H1, if it's possible, could Barbara Daly Burns, who is our awesome uh, supervisor for language arts, is joining us tonight? If there's a way, if we could keep her as H1, no matter what happens, it would probably be good just because give her a chance to present, and then we can move on with any of the rest of the business. But I know that uh, she's eager, and and I, I I think she has some awesome stuff to share. So I would just suggest, no matter what we do, that we keep <coughs> keep her as that H1 if we could. Okay, should we move it to H2? That's fine. Okay. Um, so I will entertain a motion to move H4 to H2. I make a motion that we uh, make a motion to move H4 to H2. Okay, and just uh, keep in mind that um, for Lisa, we just like to say that I can call on you just so that she knows who is making the motions. I'm oh, sorry. Like her um, minutes, so. Sorry. No, I know we'll, we'll get through it. <laughs> it just it makes it easy for her to, to write the minutes down. And that's why I do uh, Plord and Griffin as well when I talk to either of them, because it's just one of those, it's easier to go. <laughs> so if someone wants to second that. Jacob and Mari second. Okay, um, we will do a roll call vote. Uh, Madhu? Aye. Sophia? Aye. Plord? Aye. Jacob? Aye. Rini? Aye. Griffin? Aye. Dina? Aye. Tony? Aye. Okay, I'm aye as well. So therefore we'll move H4 to H2. I have one, I'm sorry, Ashley, this is Dana. I have one more question. Um, since my motion was currently on the table and I know we just went through it, but That's since funny. my motion was on the table, it wasn't seconded, but do, I need, seconded. To rescind, but, but do I need to rescind my motion? because my motion was still on the table to move it to H1. I, I just want to make sure that we're correct. No, it wasn't my motion was on the table to move H4 to H1. We had discussion, no one seconded it. Then it was motion to go to H2. So I guess okay. technically I need to rescind my H1 motion. 
<laughs> Correct. Okay. okay. Um, so, so I, I know, I'm sorry. I just didn't want to, everybody was doing the thing, but yeah, I just want to make so, sure that we're doing it right. Yep. Yeah. So you can resend it. Then we'll have to vote to take it back. Sorry. This is Dana. I rescind my motion. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, we need a second. Jacob Murray second. Okay. Um, I don't believe there will be a discussion. You never seconded it to no. me. Was it ever Jake, real? Jacob seconded it. No, the first one. The first one wasn't did, seconded. It was never seconded at all. It wasn't. It on. Yeah, so I think we I think we can just take a rescission and call it a day. Okay. Yeah. Let's just do that. Sounds good. <laughs> Let's go with H2 then for that. Okay. So now we are at the approval of minutes. Christina Plord, I'd like to make a motion to approve the October 28th and November 10th minutes. Jacob and Mari second. Okay, any discussion at this time? If you want to raise your hand, if you have anything to change. Um, you could take your hands down now at this point if you have anything. If not, um, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Madhu? Aye. Sophia? Aye. Plord? Aye. Jacob? Aye. Rini? Aye. Griffin? Aye. Dana? Aye. Tony? Um, aye as well. Therefore, the minutes stay as is. Okay. Next up is the public participation. Um, Tony will be um, timing everyone for two minutes and give a 30 second uh, verbal and visual. And if you could, when you speak, if you could um, list your name and your address, and then you'll have the two minutes. Uh, Rebecca Risley. Hi, thanks. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, so uh, thank you. First of all, welcome to the two new additions to the board. I am hopeful that your voices and ideas for moving college schools forward will be well received and considered in all matters, including the important budget planning that work that's ahead. Um, I've been a taxpayer for 17 years and had a student for seven of them. I'm extremely concerned about how the approach to budgeting is developing over time. I respectfully request that the board as a whole asks and allows our superintendent to develop and present a true level services and needs-based budget. While there are many areas where I see uh, improvements could be made and for our students' needs, I'm not going to belabor any of those points. I'd like to leave that to the expertise, of course, to Dr. Willett and his staff to determine what areas should be shored up to ensure student success. However, what I will say is that we can't continue to start from zero. We can't expect that cuts will be made and found. Um, starting from that preconceived place does a huge disservice to our youth, our teachers, and our town. We need to be asking what do talent students need to succeed in the future? What tools and support can our community provide to compete with other schools and make our town a place people want to raise their families? And how do we support our staff to ensure long tenures and job satisfaction? But we can no longer stop at asking the questions and checking the box that the questions were asked. We need to actually put these improvements into place starting now and planning for additional sustained growth down the road. The board needs to refocus on their charter to support and advocate for the requirements of our students and staff and to provide an outstanding educational experience. The town council could explore creative ways to help residents in need rather than shifting the burden of constant cuts to the board. For years, amazing groups like TEPTO, TEP, and Boosters have stepped up to bolster funding shortfalls. Could something similar perhaps be done on the town side of the equation by civil, civic groups like Town and Cares and others to provide resources to residents who find that their taxes have become unmanageable? If it's not sustainable for our schools to always shoulder the burden and expect to retain the forward thinking educational quality that Talent has no, was known for 15 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Liz Costa. Hi everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful to both Sophia and to Madhu for stepping up to be part of the BOE. So I'm very appreciative. Uh, I would like to thank the staff, the teachers, the admin and the nurses of our school system, as well as Dr. Willett. And with this advocate for an assistant superintendent, having seen very many uh, late night emails, texts, et cetera, and personal notes uh, or uh, letters to our home. 
Um, and then finally, uh, secondarily, I'd like to know where we are in the para contract, and I'm going to continue to advocate for paying them the full amount with, of what they should have been, been paid the last three years to prevent them from leaving to other schools or for other roles. Uh, we've invested a lot of money in training people for them to leave to go to other schools. And then finally, I'm asking for Dr. Willett to put forth a needs-based budget to continue with the progressive school system that we have here in Tolland and to present a budget that will allow you to implement the ideas that are necessary to keep, help our students progress and keep up with the rest of the uh, community. Thank you. And Liz, did you say your address? Uh, sorry, 54 Josiah Lane. Thank Tolland. you. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Jennifer Galichick. Hi, Jen Galichant, 150 Timber Trail. I submitted a letter to the board last week asking that every member supports Dr. Willett in presenting a needs-based budget. I hope all members of the board are listening to what our schools truly need to provide an excellent education for our students. I specifically addressed the need for smaller class sizes and one-to-one -one tech, and the sad fact that if the true needs of students were being accounted for correctly, then parents, students, and staff would not be dealing with many of the fears and frustrations with both during a health crisis. This time has shown the shortcomings within TPS and we need to begin the work of correcting them. I'd like to thank Dr. Willett, Ms. Plourd, Ms. Sylvan, and Ms. Griffin for their responses to my latest email. This is the third email I've sent in the last couple months and all have been largely ignored by the majority with Chairperson Lundgren and Mr. Holt ignoring all of them. I'm frustrated that there is no authentic dialogue between the community and this board. We speak at public participation with no response as well as write letters with little response. I know many others in the community, many on this call have had the same experience. Sadly, many of us are teachers, volunteers, coaches, and most are parents, but yet none of our opinions or insight appears to be valued or respected by many of you. You were elected to represent all of us, and I hope to hear from all of you soon. Lastly, I'd like to welcome our new board members, Madhu and Sophia. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and opinions, especially as we begin the budget process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to uh, Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Harold, 194 Sugar Hill Road, and um, welcome to Medu and Sophia. Super excited to um, have you guys participate. Um, I wasn't going to say anything tonight. I sent in a letter and um, I got a response, and um, I, which is actually more than I expected to get since I, like Jennifer, often get ignored or no response. But anyway, um, I wrote specifically about um, communicating with the minority and including them in the leadership meetings. And already it appears that that's not happening. And um, Dana even asked if they could, if you could move the business of the new board members up and um, she didn't know what was gonna be spoken about even though she emailed you. And that's the communication problem that I wrote about. I hope you all read it. Um, I'd also like to advocate for um, an assistant superintendent or some kind of COVID coordinator right now because um, having had having gone through the process of having two kids in quarantine and talking to Dr. Willett at 10 o'clock at night because my child couldn't go to school the next day, it was a lot. And um, I think he needs some support from an additional staff that he can delegate his workload to. So um, that's all. I wrote more, but it's in the email. Thanks so much. Okay, perfect. Let's go to uh, Bethany. Bethany? Okay, we will come back to her. Let's go to Shay. Um, hi, um, I just wanted to uh, first extend a warm welcome to our new board members. Um, but I just wanted to speak real briefly at this time, um, just because I'm aware that we're at the, oh, I'm sorry, I'm Shay Valera, 185 Coley Road. Um, and we're at the beginning of a new budget season with the first budget work workshop on November 30th. So I'm a parent of two children in the Tallinn school system, member of this town and also of the school system. So I'm asking the board to please consider a needs of our kids based budget and how the impact of our past budget decisions have impacted our schools. I'm asking that we consider a budget that addresses what is needed for student successes rather than a bottom line given by the town. 
I write to you, um, well, this is part of my email that I wrote um, earlier this week, because we are in the midst of a tumultuous time and our students' needs are vastly different than what they were even six months ago. And that needs to be taken into consideration when we talk about our budget this year. Um, so I hope to hear in the coming months how we will address these concerns in the short term, but also in the long term. Uh, I know that of all stakeholders, um, our administrators, Dr. Willette, community members, board members, are all involved with advocating for what is best for our kids' needs and engage in meaningful dialogue throughout this next budget season. We can come to a consensus on a budget um, that is physical responsible, physically responsible and meets the needs of all of our students. This is a very unusual school year and it's going to impact us for years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's try to go back to Bethany. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> let's try this again. Bethany Lesko, 26 Deer Meadow. Uh, good evening, Board of Ed. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Willett for his never ending dedication to our students and tirelessly going above and beyond in his communication and ever changing daily tasks. Second, I had sent an email this week also indicating my concerns for upcoming budget discussions. I hope the board is listening to the community and will proceed with open discussions regarding the questions that are being presented. I have deep concerns that has already fallen on deaf ears, just as we've seen the request to have a Board of Ed bipartisan agenda. Lastly, I'd like to welcome our new board members. I can only hope that these new members will be accepted as part of a team and be able to help this board move forward to obtain goals in the best interest of talent children. With all this said, I optimistically look forward to the board's ability to overcome past issues and strengthen the Talon Public Schools. Thank you. And I just need your address, please. Oh, 26 Deer Meadow. Thank you very much. Um, Sam. Good evening, Sam Adlerstein, 164 Pine Hill Road. Uh, first, Madhu, Sophia, welcome to the board. I hope this experience for you is, is rewarding. Um, I'm confident that you're going to um, contribute in a way that benefits all the students of Tolland, and I feel grateful for your service. Um, I heard a suggestion tonight about a COVID coordinator um, right away. I think that's a great idea. I wish the board would consider that. Um, just seeing and, and getting even a small sense of what Dr. Willett is trying to manage at this time feels untenable. And um, you know, if even if, if it doesn't result in that, having a, a discussion about what he's doing related to COVID and how that's being managed, I think would be important at the board just to make sure that in this important time, all your bases are covered and, and you're not expecting too much from one person. And lastly, I just wanna echo what I've heard from a number of people today that um, a request that the budget begin with a good understanding of, of the needs, prioritized detail, clear understanding of the needs of the district um, compared to um, other, other um, stakes in the ground and um, that, we, that we commonly use. And if you can do that before the first budget workshop, I think it would benefit us all and then use, use that as a way of navigating the budget workshops um, in a, in a part participative kind of way. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Let's go to uh, Brett Wells. Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome the new board members. Thank you all for your tireless efforts and your time and the opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, I myself also, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Brett Wells, 350 Old Post Road. Um, I myself sent a communication today uh, to the Board of Ed. So I would like to thank Madhu and Jacob for your response. Um, it's, it's refreshing to know that elected officials are paying attention and listening to their constituents, regardless of direction of opinion. Um, I felt in course of due time that maybe I would reiterate my email and electronic communication to you all in case you missed it. So. What I wrote was, uh, good morning, Tallinn Board of Education members, Dr. Willett. I'm writing you today, not only in regards to the upcoming Board of Ed budget process, but about Tallinn's education system in general. First off, I'd like to thank each of you for your devotion, your compassion, and tireless efforts representing not just my children, <clears throat> but every child within the Tallinn community. We are currently among unprecedented times, 
dealing with a national pandemic. Our elected officials, administrators, teachers, parents, children alike are all stressed, overworked, and spread very thin during the uncertainty of today's social and political climate. So please know your efforts certainly do not go unnoticed, especially within my household. Although this is my first communication to the Board of Ed in nearly eight years, my last advocating for all day kindergarten in Tallinn, I've been here for a few years, I have some concerns within the direction the Tallinn public school system is heading. One of the glaring things that stands out to me personally is the budget history and the direction it's heading in. Since 2013, Tallinn Board of Ed has averaged an annual increase of only 1.63% when the national GDP growth since 1947 has averaged 3.16%. And honestly, that 1.63% average over that seven years is only bolstered by a 2.93% average from 2014 to 2016. The average increase in the past three budgets is 0.54%. As a taxpayer in town with three children, one who's uh, graduated, gonna have, those figures I'm are sorry, unacceptable. Brett, I'm going to have to uh, stop you because I try to be fair with everyone with the two minute time limit. Um, and Tony had okay. 30 seconds in the two minutes. Appreciate your time. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, Jaden? Hey, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm excited for our two new board members, Sophia and uh, Matthew. You guys are going to be awesome. Um, and I know and hope that uh, you're going to put as much uh, dedication, hard work, uh, and commitment uh, as Karen Moran and Kate Howard Bender did. Um, off that point, I got two things for the Board of Ed today. Um, I really hope that the Board of Ed is, uh, budget is not ultimately drafted up by the town council or town manager. Um, we know that's not their job, it's the Board of Ed's job. The Board of Ed uh, must do its job of providing a quality education. Um, give these kids what they deserve and what they need. Uh, start there, don't start from zero. That's I, I'm asking you, please. Um, Going back to the basics led to where we are now, less funding for our schools and the resignation of two fantastic, brilliant, caring Board of Ed members. So I hope the lesson has been learned there, uh, but who knows at this point. Um, curious to know when our leaders will be back in person. This is an actual, uh, uh, I'm curious. Um, I'm curious to know when the Board of Ed meetings are gonna be back in person, um, considering the students are still being given the option of in-person learning. I'm just, I'm, if my ball players can be in person, if my sister can be in person, uh, why aren't you? I'm just, I'm, that's a genuine question. So um, have a good night. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And Jaden, you need to um, just state oh, your right. name, please. Jaden Reddersford, 68 Old Stafford Road, Tallinn, Connecticut, 06084. Thank you. At this time, if any other um, participants would like to speak, if you could raise your hand. And if not, I will. Ashley, I'm sorry, I would like to speak, but oh. I can't find that hand button even since last time. This is Deirdre Goldsmith. That's um, fine. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Deirdre Goldsmith, 21 Marlboro Glade. Um, I'm so grateful for Sophia and Madhu for stepping up and, and joining the board. And um, thank you very much. And thanks all of you for your work. Uh, I wanted to reiterate what a lot of people I'm hearing is saying tonight. Please consider the real impact of this pandemic on our children during both the 2019-2020 and the 2020-21 school years when you approach this year's budget. Due to the devastating impact of the coronavirus, academic rigor and mental health needed to take a back seat to ensuring the safety of all. Consequentially, many students are now anxious and depressed and based on data, they're not meeting targeted academic levels across the board. In response to this situation, I hope you consider it paramount to request that our superintendent prepare a needs-based budget Thank you for your investment of time and attention to our students, which is the very reason that you stepped up to serve in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else at this time? If not, I will close the public participation and we will move on to correspondence. Okay. Right, thank so you, Madam Chair. Go ahead. All right. So. We received an email expressing disappointment in the Board of Education attendance at the town council meeting with the appointment of the new members. Email asking for two items to be discussed as part of the budget process. One, 
the need for additional teachers to reduce classroom sizes, and two, a robust plan for technology. An email discussing an approach to the upcoming budget season in light of board goals three and the second part of four. Email asking for a minority voice at the leadership table, consideration of an assistant superintendent via the COVID funds, and a level budget with additional needs. Email asking that the budget process be started with a strong focus on the support of schools. Email requesting that a needs-based budget is presented based upon the direct requests and needs of the staff. Email requesting that the budget process starts from a standpoint that asks, what do Tallinn's young people need to succeed in the future? An email articulating perceived issues brought to light due to COVID. Email articulating the need for a need-based budget. An email requesting a need-based budget that will, quote, will allow the school system to rebuild in this time of education change. An email concerned with Dr. Willett single-handedly fielding all of the COVID calls and requesting that the board seek out the needs of the staff for these budget discussions. Email requesting that the board look for the needs of the Tallinn students and staff before looking to see where cuts could be made. An email asking the board to be mindful of the needs of our students as we look to support or make cuts to the budget. Email asking the board to start with a needs-based budget as the starting point for discussions. Email asking that the board ask Dr. Willett to identify a budget where we can decrease class size, add more staff, and up our technology game. And an email asking the board to consider providing appropriate one-to-one -one technology for all students, reducing class sizes, and maintaining staff without making reductions to staff or course offerings. Uh, this is as of about five o'clock this evening. If some others have come in, I did not have a chance to get them in. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Tony. And we can move on to points of information. At this time, um, board members can raise their blue hand and um, speak to what they would like to. I'm gonna take uh, this minute though to take an opportunity to address the mischaracterizations that were made against us last meeting. I make these comments in my individual capacity and they do not reflect the feelings of the board as a whole. I will not list every accusation nor go into depth with each topic, but I would like the record to show the following for distance learning. Um, no one can be prepared for a global pandemic. We have only been in office for a year this month and essentially only for four before the pandemic hit. To place blame on this leadership and this board for not having enough devices is completely and utterly unfounded as prior boards would shoulder more that accusation fairly. We created a COVID fund to use during this time to cover unexpected and unknown expenses and set money aside for technology purchases in the ERF. This board has focused on how to get through the pandemic and focused on how to meet the educational needs of all students. Agenda formation. Agenda formation is fairly formula form formulaic. Since we are in the beginning of a pandemic and building a new school, many items that take priority are timelines for state regulations, Birch Grove, town council, et cetera. Timelines are the first consideration for any type of agenda being formed. We work with Dr. Willett to ensure that we are not in violation of these timelines. There is a huge list of items that have not been able to cover due to the pandemic. For one example, the ELA presentation that was requested back in February has been pushed back multiple times and we're finally having the presentation tonight. Uh, this is not because we do not want the presentation. This is only because of meeting the required deadlines. Communications, the allegations of the board chair not responding to emails and communications are not valid. The board chair and vice chair have been responsive. It may be that the replies were not what was hoped for, but responses were made. As a matter of fact, I have spent numerous hours having one-to-one -one coffee dates with members of our team, both Democratic and Republicans, discussing how we can work as a team. I've made it clear in my chair reports that working together does need to happen. Unless board members are willing to do that, I as chair have the responsibility to continue, the, to continue moving the meeting along to get the important work done to benefit our students. Curriculum committee. The purpose of the curriculum committee is to determine if the current curriculum is working and benefiting our students as they progress in the town and public schools and beyond. The committee is prepared to discuss curriculum with the three supervisors 
address their needs and things they find lacking. The committee is working with Dr. Willett to ensure that curriculum is current standards and teachers have the resources that they need for budget. The current board has worked with Dr. Willett to determine the needs of the student. We recognize there isn't unlimited funding or a magic wand to get everything that everyone wants. We need to review our budget and prioritize. From the beginning, we, we stated reading and math were important skills that could not be brushed aside. After instructional rounds, it was made even more clear how important literacy programs were in our elementary schools. We made sure that this was added back into the budget. Some may disagree about what's more important to provide to our students, but this board isn't afraid to ask the questions to determine that and work with our superintendent to get there. Partisanship. There were claims of partisanship among board members. I have always been fair giving everyone a chance to speak first before other members get it to speak a second time. I ensure items do not go to board action if a member is awaiting their second turn by not entertaining the motion. Being a courteous member means being cognizant of not monopolizing meeting time and letting all members have a say. Voting records will show that the Republican Party has not always voted together and there have been many differences of opinions. Education should not be the ultimate nonpartisan issue and I remain committed to working with everyone on this board irrespective of their political affiliation. In closing, time is being provided to this board from each member. Let's be productive with it. Moving ahead as a team with an optimistic outlook will create positive changes. So that's all I have for that. So at this time, um, Dana. Um, thank you, Ashley. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everybody who has sent in the numerous emails. We're at double digits times a couple in the last 48 to 72 hours. Mr. Wells, I'm sorry that you didn't have the opportunity in, within your two minutes to, to finish um, your statement because I felt that your email was very thorough and um, informative and something that we should really come over and discuss. Um, there was there was many emails and I and I do thank all the folks that were on public participation tonight. Um, spoke eloquently. Yes, we are going into budget season, so it is a top of mind. And and being in a pandemic and, and where we are is is a different world, if you will. Um, so I do thank everybody for for writing in. Um, Quickly about the pair of negotiations. I, we can't really talk about them and I can defer this to Rini, but Ms. Costa brought that up when we are in the midst of, of those meetings. Um, that's really what we can say, but uh, or I can defer that comment to Dr. Willett as well. You know, that Ms. Costa brought that up as a concern um, for Perez where we are with that. Um, so thank you. Um, as far as the bipartisanship, um, on the agendas and such. Um, Ms. Lunger and I sent you an email this week for clarity on the agenda and I didn't receive a response. So it's not the first time, it's not gonna be, it's not the first time, it's not the second time and it was just me on the email. So um, I would just hope after we heard your retort um, to the meeting from last week and your pre-formulated and written note to all of us, um, I'm hoping that we can go forward and be at a, gen a genuine board and be a genuine team. And I hope that I asked a simple two sentence question to ask what H4 um, consisted of so that I can be prepared as a board member to know what's going on in the meeting and a courtesy of an email would have been kind. So that's what I have to say. I do look forward to us working as a team. I work forward to us not lecturing or lashing out or telling each other what we can and cannot do. I, I look forward to a respectful team environment and I look forward to Madhu and Sophia bringing in some fantastic um, feedback and ideas and thoughts um, to this board to support the Tallinn public school systems. So thank you. Thank you. I hope I'm not keeping you up, Jacob. Thank you, Dana. Um, Dr. Will, if you could uh, lower Brett's hand down too, that would be appreciated. Um, let's go to Tony. Yeah, I uh, just want to, like I said, take a moment to uh, officially welcome Madhu and Sophia. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with both of you and having some wonderful conversations. 
secondly, as looking, you know, reading the email traffic that we've gotten, it's a comment that was made in one of them that this was the time for the parents and uh, members of Thailand Public Schools to speak up and have their voices heard. And uh, that, that excites me. You know, seeing the emails, like Dana said, the multiple emails that have come through, uh, I've read them not only for my correspondence, but, but also to, to get a feel and to understand. Uh, I appreciate it. I sincerely hope you keep writing that more if you write in. Uh, rest assured, I have worked my way through some of them responding, but I will respond to, to all of them in time. Again, thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to Madhu. All right, so thank you, Ashley. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for the warm welcome. Um, I hope to work together as a team. Um, and I wanted to also thank Tony and Christina for um, including me in on the policy committee meetings. They've been you know, vastly educational and I look forward to working with you guys on that committee. Um, and um, I know there have been a bunch of emails come in and I just got my email set up. So from what I have received, I have responded to. So, um, you know, I will try to respond to all of them um, as best as I can. That was it. Okay, uh, Jacob. Um, so just wanted to give a quick response to some of our budget emails um, where I come from, you know, the perspective that I approach this from and uh, what I believe the most most of our board members approach this from. You know, I'm a recent graduate of Tolland High School and most of our members have uh, kids in the school system. Um, so I, I really don't believe that there's any intent to try to damage the school system um, or to be kind of a, a tool of the town council up in any sort of way. Um, we start, our baseline is always the superintendent's proposed budget, which we'll receive up in January. Um, and I, I sure hope that's a need-based budget. Um, Dr. Willett would know better than anyone else what our true needs are. And we're already starting to have a lot of those conversations. Um, earlier today up in the curriculum committee, we started to have quite a few conversations about our COVID needs and we're gonna to continue to have that, um, especially as we move up into January. And um, although finding efficiencies is a very important part of the budget process, I think it's important not to mistake that for um wanting to to damage the school system i think in fact it makes whatever budget we come up with more effective because if we can go up in front of the town council and defend every dime that's in there and know exactly what purpose it's playing i think that gives it a much better chance of being passed so it's a very important part of the process but um i don't think i just speak for myself when i say that uh we really do want to put forward a budget that does support the needs of our kids that's all. Okay, let's go to Plord. Thanks, Ashley. Um, just to address a few things from public participation and correspondence, uh, the needs-based budget. Yes, I'm going to ask Dr. Willett to provide us with a needs-based budget. Uh, I also think that he will uh, go into depth in the curriculum committee and some of our other committees um, so that we can have uh, that background knowledge uh, to talk about the budget and, and advocate for it. Um, and maybe in, in one of those committees, maybe curriculum, Jacob, um, maybe focusing in on student achievement and identifying where uh, some of the holes are. Um, so I'm in listening mode right now and I, I appreciate all the emails. I will get to them. I did respond to a few. Um, let's see what's next. Jaden asked, uh, why aren't you in person? Uh, there's, we, we tried to go back to in-person. There's a, a, it's pretty complicated with the laws from the state. Um, myself personally, um, if I can say, you know, I stay home so that the kids can stay in school. This virus isn't going away. So if I can reduce exposure um, to my son to then him going in schools, uh, that's, that's kind of where I'm at with that as the community spread goes up. Um, and then in regards to, um, the last meeting, I, I'm really um, in an effort, I, I really like to move forward. Uh, I'm excited to move forward with our new members. Uh, and I think it's only when we learn from our past but not dwell on it, that we can continue to be a voice for change. Uh, I think we're all leaders here, all nine of us, um, 10 of us, including Walt. 
Um, and it's our job together to build consensus in the boardroom and in the community. Uh, so I'm ready uh, to move forward. I sense a more positive energy. Um, and I think you'll see some bipartisan decisions coming out of committees and coming to the board. So I'm excited. So that's it. Thanks, guys. Let's go to Rini. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Um, I just wanted to do a quick response to um, some of our uh, letter writers, uh, similar to others. I, I apologize that I have not gotten back. We've gotten quite a few in and um, I have not with work and, and everything had an opportunity to, to get back to people. So I have that on my to-do list and I apologize if there's been a delay around that. Wanna just um, do a in meeting, welcome to Madhu and Sophia. It's great to have you on board and looking forward to working with you. And regarding the budget, I, I kind of echo what Jacob said. I, I absolutely believe that Dr. Will will be and presenting us with a needs-based budget. That's what we're always after. And we're here to support the students and provide them with the best education that the Tallinn Public Schools can. Um, so that's it for me, thanks. Okay, uh, Sophia? I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for the warm welcome and to our community for all of the emails. I apologize also for not returning them. I have to admit a lot goes into these board meetings and boy was I reading through everything and preparing and I just didn't get to those emails. But I wanted to say that I appreciate them um, and I encourage the public to send those emails. I see them as a benchmark or as a guide as to what the community wants us to do as a board. So I definitely appreciate them. I am definitely in support of a needs-based budget and I welcome Dr. Willett's um, suggestions, his proposals, and just um, educating us on what our schools need. Thank you. Okay, at this time, um, we will move to the uh, student representative report. So we can have Simmer and Alexandra. Um, hi everyone. So this week we're having a food drive at the high school and it was supposed to end on Friday, but we decided to extend it because um, many students were sent home. And also last week on November 11th, the NHS um, National Honor Society, which is comprised of seniors, uh, went around the community and raked leaves. And also I'm really excited to work with the new board members. Hi everyone. Um, last week we had our spirit week at the high school. And even though we weren't able to have the homecoming or the pep rally, it was definitely a really good way to get everyone involved and brighten spirits. Um, and then firstly, I just want to like thank all of the staff and teachers at our schools. And secondly, secondly, um, although it's not the entire student body, I've heard like many students and staff mention that they're anxious about being in school right now because they feel unsafe in the building. So I thought I'd let everyone know. That's all. Um, quick question for you, ladies. Um, how did the finish up of the mental health week go? Um, we're still, Alexandra, we had the um, raffles, which were um, a success. And we're thinking about having a speaker come in during advisory. We just have to work out dates and stuff. Yep, the week went pretty well. Um, obviously, we wish it, like if COVID didn't happen, it would have gone, would have had more planned, but we're still going to try and carry the rest of that, those things throughout the uh, rest of the year. And student council as a whole, we're definitely focusing on mental health a lot more this year than in the past years, which I think is something that we've been looking to do regardless of the pandemic. Thank you ladies very much for everything. Okay, um, let's move to the superintendent's report. So Dr. Willett. So we have a, we have a treat for you this evening. Um, as you know, you know, we've had a lot of uh, things going on recently, which um, made it harder for us to do some of the, the work that we really, you know, know and love and, um, you know, that we all, you know, cherish. And this is an opportunity for us to get back to the, back to the stuff that we love and, and, and you know, a little break from all of the, the stuff that makes us nervous. Um, we have uh, with us tonight, Barbara Daly Burns. Uh, she is our supervisor for English language arts. She has done uh, an incredible job in the time that she's been here. She's She's done more for this district than, than 
than any of the other ELA people I know in my career. So we're very lucky to have her. And tonight she's going to share a presentation of, of the English language arts um, dynamics of the district. So uh, without taking any more virtual oxygen from the room, if you don't mind, I'll hand it over to, uh, to uh, Ms. Daly Burns. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Willett. Hello, board. Thank you for this opportunity. That was a very kind welcome. I appreciate it. Um, so we have a PowerPoint that Dr. Willett is going to share momentarily. And just while he's getting that up, for those of you uh, that I do not know, as he said, I am Barbara Daly Burns, a supervisor of ELA. I've been in Tallinn since 2016, first as the assistant principal of Birch Grove, um, and since 2017 in my current position. Um, I probably shouldn't admit this next part, but I will. I have been teaching since 1987, so for 33 years. This is my 33rd year of teaching. Hard for me to say that because it goes by in a flash, believe it or not. Um, and uh, I have several different certifications, reading language arts, classroom teacher, and administrator. So I, I have a diverse background, which I think helps me in this position. Um, slide, please. Can you change the slide? Ah, there you go, thanks. Sorry, there's, so, a, there's a lag, I think. <laughs> that's okay, I'm sorry, I'm so, just impatient. I'm impatient, sorry. So, um, so I'll give you a broad overview of different things that have been happening since 2017 across the district in English language arts and then go into more specifics. Um, so we've been able to put in a, a quite a few different things to address needs that we saw or that I saw um, when I took the position in 2017. And 17. So we have uh, journeys. We had an, uh, I'll just go over this and then I'll speak more specifically momentarily. We have a journeys program. We have Fountas and Finale guided readers. We have decodables, both geodes and Flyleaf are the two name brands. We also have a program for phonological awareness called Hegarty. Uh, we have another program in the upper grades called Wit and Wisdom. Philography and MegaWords also are in the upper grades. Um, and then for our striving readers, we have a program called Fire, which I'll go into again in a little, a little later on. At the middle school and high school, we've really spent the last couple of years trying to diversify our texts, our novels, so that our students are experiencing uh, a broader view of the world. Um, and I'll talk about that as well. Slide. Thank you. So in English language arts, one of the things that we have to do that was la something that was a gap uh, in the past is um, the use of what's called universal ass assessments or universal screenings. Uh, that is part of the RTI, SRBI process. So at the K-8 level, uh, we use the dynamic indicators of early reading skills, also known as DIBBLES, you may have heard that before, but DIBBLES actually does stand for something and that's what it stands for. And that's a progress monitoring tool, which means every two weeks or so, the teachers do what's called a dipstick. They do a quick little probe to see how their kids are doing um, and then use that data to inform their instruction. Uh, so that we have in the K-8. We also have the SPIRE program K-8 for our striving students that are learning, just learning to read or struggling to learn to read. Um, so that is a program that we found um, we in collaboration with Patty Hess, the Director of Pupil Services, about two and a half years ago. And we've been able to fully implement, again, K-8. And it's really very, very targeted for kids that are struggling to learn to read. So we have that as well. And as I mentioned, we have our updated and responsive text for, for grades 9 through 12. Slide, please. Thank you. We also have um, digitally, we have RAS Kids, which many of you know about. That is a digital platform. As I mentioned, it has books and quizzes for the kids that they can read right on the screen. There are literally hundreds and hundreds, they say billions, I don't know, it's quite billions, but hundreds and hundreds uh, of leveled readers for our kids to access. Um, it is an award-winning resource that provides all sorts of differentiation. It's particularly useful during COVID. Um, we, teachers were able to link right into their Google Classroom from RAS and that helped a great deal. 
particularly in the spring when everything turned around so very quickly and uh, we had to just go to a totally different teaching platform. So this helped with that um, very well. It also has uh, a whole section of um, teacher resources available as well. And this year in conjunction with Mark Rudy, the science supervisor, we were able to add science A to Z, which has those texts geared towards science. So that's been very useful as well. Okay, slide please. So now just going into a little more detail about some of the different overviews that I mentioned a moment ago. So what SPIRE is, SPIRE that like Dibbles, it actually does stand for something. It's a specialized program, individualized reading excellence. So several years ago, we realized that we needed a more explicit program for our striving readers. Um, after an exhaustive search, we found SPIRE, we being Patty Hess and I, um, and we have used it both in intervention uh, with our students as well as special education students to build their foundational reading skills, which as we all know, later impacts um, reading development for students. So it's very, it's intensive, it's research-based, explicit and systematic. It follows what's called the structured literacy approach, which goes into the science of reading, which is the most current research uh, revolving around reading and the reading brain. We can talk at length at that uh, on that topic if you'd ever like to uh, listen to me go on about it. It's um, a consistent 10 step approach and it's multi-sensory. We find that particularly for our kids that need a little more, that multi-sensory approach really tends to have the most effect. Um, so that's a very good thing. And it does teach to mastery. So that's also something to note. Slide please. Thank you. Um, a couple of years ago, we also did a pilot of two different, actually three different reading programs because our reading program was at that point um, pretty old. It was no longer aligned to the Common Core um, or was not aligned to the Common Core because its published date was prior to the Common Core. And so what happens in school systems everywhere really is that you, kind of, you still kind of have this amorphous curriculum that has all these different aspects of it, but it's not cohesive. And we really wanted to, I wanted to bring some cohesion to that. So we did a pilot of two different programs. We did um, McGraw-Hill and Journeys in um, grades one through five, K through five, I'm sorry. And K also did a third one. They did the parent to symphony guided reading. It was a full year pilot with teacher representatives from every grade level. Um, and I have to, I have to really give the kudos to the teachers. They I put out the email at about nine o'clock on the night of the, that I was looking for people to volunteer. And by 9.15, I had 30 people willing to uh, volunteer to do a pilot. So that really speaks very highly of um, the commitment of our teachers. Um, and the training was provided for both programs, for all the programs. And after the pilot, after the full year pilot, we did do a very democratic vote and chose, um, and we chose Journeys 2017. So it is now aligned with the Common Core. It's comprehensive. It has an instructional system for reading both literature and informational text. It also obviously has a strong foundational skills component because as I mentioned, very much about the science of reading, structured literacy, um, and it develops mastery for speaking, listening, and writing. It also has a digital platform um, that we are able to access. And a recent discovery this week is that there is a way to directly tie it to Google Classroom that we just found. So um, that was exciting new news um, for, for the teachers as well. Okay, slide please. Okay. Oh, this one got out of order. I apologize. This one's out of, a little out of order, but that's okay. So understanding by design is the overall philosophy of uh, what we're using, which is a backwards curriculum design. By backwards, I mean you, you think of where you wanna get to and you start there. If I know I wanna teach to this, and then you kind of back up, how am I going to get there? How am I going to help my kids get there? So what that means is that we have that end in mind. What is our goal? What do we want? Um, and what do we want our students to learn and be able to do? So we've been very fortunate last year. We've had um, Renit Carter out of Mateague and Associates. Uh, Grant Wiggins and Mateague are the two that kind of 
draw understanding by design to the forefront. Um, and Renit works directly with Jay Matigue. So we've been very lucky to have her working with us. Obviously, um, during the during March and the beginning of this year, that's been put on hold. But um, I do think it's noteworthy so that you all have, uh, so you know the direction that we're going and why we're going in that direction. So at this point, we've, we've trained the entire district. And last year, that work was focused at the high school level. This year, um, we were, the original plan was that it was going to be focused at the middle school level. Obviously, um, that's on hold right now, but you know, who's to say? It could, it could happen in a couple of months. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, so that's kind of the overarching uh, theme of where we're going um, curricularly in all curricular areas, actually. Okay, slide, please. Thank you. So at Birch Grove, so what do we have at Birch Grove? Well, we have our Houghton Midland, as I mentioned. We have Foundations, which is an absolutely great program, um, foundational skilled program. Any of you that have young children, you've seen them finger tapping their words and doing different things like that. That's a great program, also multi-sensory. Kindergarten, we have the Fountains and Pinnell guided reading, as well as Foundations, they have that K-3. Um, geodes are a new addition that I was able to purchase. Um, it's a decoding decodable set of books that go along very, very well with foundations. So it follows the same progression that foundations follow. So that's great. Um, and then the Hegarty, we were able to purchase, I was able to purchase last year. That's not really a program as such. The teacher just gets um, a manual and it teaches phonological awareness skills. And we know because of, again, knowing about the science of reading, that that building of phonological skills is the most important, one of the most important precursors to later being able to read. Um, and we have the flyleaf, which go along with the spire. So that's why we have two different types of decodables. The geodes really dovetail with foundations and the flyleaf dovetail with spire. And we have the spire as we already discussed. Slide, please. Thank you. So for those who don't know, and I can go through this quickly, what Foundations is, um, this has been one of our most effective programs. It, it is a program that really strengthens, as I mentioned, all those foundational skills, phonemic awareness, phonics and word study, high frequency word study, reading fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, handwriting and spelling. It's a basic skills program that teaches all the letters and the sounds and the various spelling patterns. So again, if you have young children, you may have heard them saying things like A, apple, A, B, 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 C, C, C. That's all part of foundations. All of that uh, sequence is part of foundations. We've had great success with foundations. Um, I was, I'm able to track that universal data that I spoke to several slides ago and foundations when we see a lot of, as they say in the stock market, green on the screen, that's always a good thing. Um, and so there's a lot of green on the screen for our Dibble scores. And that's in part because of foundations, because of what foundations has done for us. So that's really, I'm I just thrilled with that program. Um, and our universal data really indicates that it's been very effective. Um, slide please. And Fountas and Pinnell, a little bit about that, a little more detail. So I mean, Fountas, Gaysu, Pinnell, two very, uh, very influential reading researchers that have been around for quite a long time. I mean, Fountas is out of Leslie University up in Boston. Gaysu, Pinnell is out of a college in the Midwest. They have put together a guided reading program that our kindergarten teachers, like I mentioned, piloted and, and subsequently chose. Um, it is an excellent program. They have done extensive, our kindergarten teachers have done extensive curriculum writing utilizing this program. Um, it is a collection of published uh, guided readers, if you will, small readers, and those are used to engage the students in original text and use all of that, all that rich vocabulary and all the skills that they're using in, in foundations as well to then apply to their connected text. So it's the, te the kindergarten teachers are really enjoying that program. Slide, please.
Thank you. A little more detail about Hegarty, which I already mentioned. It's a systematic scope and sequence of skills. It is tier one. So unlike Spire or, um, yeah, Spire, which is tier two and tier three, um, this is globally given to our pre-K to two. As I meant, it's tasks um, similar to say rainbow. Now say rainbow without the rain and the kids have to say bow. And then it obviously progresses up through the phon phonemic awareness skills um, of scope and sequence. So it's been a supplemental resource that teaches those phon phonological uh, skills, which enables our kids to have the uh, ability to manipulate sounds and words, which is needed to be able to read and spell. Okay, slide please. Thank you. Um, a little more detail about the flyleaf. So the flyleaf are those ones that I mentioned that dovetail with Spire. So they are authentic decodable books. So decodable means that the, most of the vocabulary, just in case you're not a reading person, um, most of those vocabulary in those books are going to be words that the kids can sound out basically. So it's not going to include a lot of words where the child has to rely on the picture cue. It's going to inc include a lot of words where the child can sound tap, with the exception of some of the sight words that we all know that can't really be decoded like was and the and all that sort of thing have. Um, so that's what a decodable is. It's provide, and these ones provide successful and motivating first reading experiences for our students. We were so fortunate to have the Flyleaf Decodable Books as an additional resource um, that goes along with Spire. As you can see in the, in the um, graphic, it does come with binders of lessons. So you can use it as a program in its entirety as well. It comes with a binder for foundational skills, a binder for comprehension skills. So we have, um, I was able to purchase uh, some sets of that a couple of years ago. Um, for K-5, because at that point, that's where we had Spire, um, we were using Spire the most that year. Since then, we've, we've branched out with our Spire. Um, slide, please. So I know these might seem repetitive, it's just that I tried to give the overview and then more detail, get more granular. So the, the geodes, another type of decodable, like I mentioned, but these ones dovetail with foundations. Now these ones, they've only been recent, fairly recently published. Um, there's 64 informational and literary texts. They do include a teacher resource. I love that they call it geodes with the idea of being like a geode rock when you crack it open. It's uh, filled with wonderfulness. So that's kind of why they call it that. Um, it's a great, uh, a great book series. I was only able to purchase it for kindergarten at this point, one set. So the teachers share one set of geode books. Um, I'm hoping that in the future, I'm able to purchase the set that goes along with first grade foundation, second grade foundations, and, and subsequently third grade foundations, um, because that is how it's designed. It's designed to dovetail with foundations. So um, I'm hoping to be able to do that in the future. I was not able to do that this past year. Um, slide, please. Thank you. So at Tolland Intermediate School, we also have journeys, as I mentioned. We have foundations, it only goes up to grade three. That's, that's when that program ends. Um, we have what's called Wit and Wisdom for grade five, which is a novel-based program that I'll explain more about momentarily. We also have Spellography, which I'll explain about, mega words, and then as I mentioned, we have the Flyleaf because we were able to get them to that level. Slide, please. So we have Spellography is a newer um, program that in all honesty, we used last year and because of COVID this year, we're just not doing it right this second in its totality. Um, it is a classroom tested spelling and word study program. So if you think about the progression, we have foundations for word study and then we had this gap. So we had our kids get through foundations and then there was a gap when they got to fourth grade. So we needed something that included a higher level word study. And that's what spellography is. Um, it is, it's filled with kind of, it's done in this really kind of 
I don't want to say gamification way, but more in like a graphic novel way. It has um, a lot of interesting uh, graphics that the kids really like, entertaining activities, engaging instruction, but it's getting at um, the morphology of words as well as the different patterns. It's by, it's written by Louisa Motes, who is again, a leading researcher um, in, in the area of reading and spelling. So um, it is a program that we have that we've been using in fourth grade, but again, we just haven't used it too much this year because of the situation that we're in. Slide, please. Um, Wit and Wisdom is our next one. Thank you. This is um, a program that was piloted for a full year last year uh, with the fifth grade and the teachers found it to be a very rigorous but very engaging curriculum. They absolutely loved it. It is novel based. So it's a great transition for the middle school because as you all know, the middle school is novel based. So it kind of bridges that gap, which is great. Um, it also dovetails very, very nicely with social studies themes. Um, they're embedded, those social studies themes are embedded within the curriculum. Now they don't completely align, but um, we've been able to make it work that mu much of it does align, but like anything, you know, it's not going to be a complete alignment. Um, we have purchased these materials uh, this year. Again, the teachers love it. And this also has an online component, which has been a lifesaver. It was a lifesaver for us in March um, and it's still a lifesaver for us now. So it has this online component. Our students love it. And our sixth grade, my, our sixth grade teachers are reporting that, excuse me, their kids this year are far, even with the pandemic hitting us in March and you know, basically kids not having the same types of experiences as they usually would at the end of a school year, the kids have been much more prepared um, for the type of rigorous reading that they do in sixth grade. <coughs> Excuse me, slide please. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so mega words is another. So again, as I talked about that continuum of building word knowledge, mega words is what we have at the fifth grade level. So we have foundations, philography, mega words. So mega words teaches the reading, spelling, and contextual use of multisyllabic words. One of the great things that mega words does, which I think really helps every kid, is it teaches the Latin and Greek roots. And we all know that if you know, if our kids know those Latin and Greek roots, they can they can, they can get to so, the meaning of so many vocabulary words. We are obviously English is Romance language. So um, it, you know, the more they know there, the better off we are. So our fifth grade teachers are using, oh, sorry. Our fifth grade teachers are using mega words um, to meet the needs of our students in the areas of spelling and vocabulary. And it's a great program. Slide please. Thank you. Now at the middle school. So we had such great success with Wit and Wisdom in fifth grade that uh, we, I do have a sixth grade teacher piloting it this year and she too is loving it. So that's really good news. Um, I'm, I'm just thrilled with that. She's absolutely loving it. Um, we, we do have Spire for our striving readers at the sixth, seventh and eighth grade level as well. Um, that was added a, a couple of years ago. As I mentioned, we have many new multicultural texts with, um, that were purchased a couple of years ago uh, through something called put out by Scholastic called Scholastic Book Clubs, but not the Scholastic Book Clubs that you know we all go in and you order books for your kids. Not that type. This is a uh, a different type of Scholastic Book Club, um, and we have we continued well. Hopefully this year we get to do some of the UBD lesson planning. We did a little bit of it with the middle school last year and we're hoping to do um, some more. So you know what, I next slide please. Um, and I already spoke about wit and wisdom, so uh, Dr. Willett, you can go to the next slide please. Thanks. So I'll just explain what the Scholastic Book Clubs are in this context. It's their, their comprehension clubs and they're centered around themes. Um, that are themes that are uh, relevant to a middle schooler's life. 
Um, so they have interactive read alouds, they have student book clubs where you can have a group of kids reading the same text. They have collaborative student book club resources for both struggling readers and ELL students, English language learners. And they are authentic texts. It's, it's not contrived text. They're authentic informational texts as well that build knowledge and use academic vocab. Um, so that's really helped build all the teachers' um, classroom libraries as well, they able, they being able to provide those. Slide, please. And at the high school, here at, the, at Talent High, we've been able to buy, or I've been able to buy um, or purchase, um, new multi multicultural texts. Again, because we want kids to see uh, the world around them and, and hear different perspectives and see and read about different perspectives. And uh, that's been a, a great tool to do so. Um, we do have the UBD lesson planning. Um, of, of course, last year was really happening quite extensively at the high school. And we do have structured literacy. We have a class now, uh, structured literacy for our striving readers, which is wonderful. And so what happens in that class is that uh, the students that are in that class are reading the same text to the best of their ability uh, with their teacher, but following a very, very, very structured approach um, to being able to access that text. So that's a great way of, of keeping our kids that are uh, striving to learn, continuing to strive to learn to be able to do so and still participate in, in the curricula of the high school. Slide, please. Thank you. So some of the books we've been, uh, I've been able to purchase are things like Trevor Noah's Born a Crime, All American Boys, The Hate You Give, The Glass Castle, Into the Wild, The Nickel Boys. Um, we really have tried to, uh, Little Fires Everywhere. I didn't even put that one on here. Um, we've really tried to expand uh, what we're able to provide. Um, and we've been working diligently to embed these more culturally responsive texts throughout the curriculum. The teachers have also been involved in all of this curriculum writing uh, using that UBD framework discussed earlier in the presentation. Slide, please. Thank you. So looking ahead in ELA, so what's to come? Um, well, we will continue, or I will continue to work on uh, culturally responsive efforts to make sure that we have a rich, classroom, that we have rich classroom libraries that are culturally responsive to the needs of a diverse population. Um, we'll continue to work on curriculum alignment um, and universal understanding by design. And we, we continue to have the portrait of a graduate work. So as we think about ELA as a whole, um, the quote that I always like to use in thinking about structured literacy and the science of reading and some of those things is that a rising tide lifts all boats. So as we continue to improve our practices in helping um, striving readers, we're also then improving the practices of helping all our not, uh, all our typical readers as well. So um, I think we've really made a lot of headway in a relatively short amount of time um, in, in moving literacy forward um, in the Tallinn Public Schools. I thank you for your time. And if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer any of them. I know I spoke very quickly. Just a, <laughs> just a quick uh, comment that, um, you know, if you could get into a time machine and go back 10 years, uh, you know, back to 2010 or even 2006 when I joined the district, um, you know, uh, you know, this Daily Burns has done an amazing job. So has Ms. Hess and others in helping create appropriate supports at each tier and level. And having appropriate supports at each tier and level is vital for the developmental needs of students. It's really no exaggeration whatsoever to say that having the right people in the right programs and the right places makes a quantifiable difference in student welfare. Um, in like the phonemic needs, um, they are addressed at all levels under the programs that Ms. Daly Burns has set up, has to set up, um, you know, and this makes a, a tangible difference in their lives at their developmental levels. If they didn't have this as they were moving through, um, they, they really would have a, a 
a uh, impacted life experience. You know, they would not do as well academically and they would not do as well in the world. I don't know, Ms. Daly Burns, if you agree with that, but these phonemic programs are absolutely vital to their development and their progress and their, you know, prosperity. Yes, so I was um, in a meeting earlier today um, and, you know, there's some staggering statistics, as Dr. Willett said, um, you know, one of them being that if 85% of adjudicated youth um, have a reading disability, um, which quite frankly is actually no surprise if you think about it, um, if you really kind of tear that apart and think about it. Another one was that um, 64%, what was it? It was in this morning's meeting, 64% uh, of kids that are still struggling to read in the later grades in middle school and high school, they drop out. It's just, they drop out of high school. It's too hard. Um, so I, I take, and Dr. Willett does, and Patty Hess does as well, we take this very, very seriously. I take this, I'm very passionate about this topic. I do, I feel it's a civil right. I feel that it is a moral imperative that we teach uh, young kids, uh, all kids, to be able to read um, at an appropriate level. And some of you may know our, our uh, deep scores across the nation are, are, are not great. Uh, they really are not. So anything we can do, anything I can do to, uh, to just create, put in place structures that make teaching systematic and explicit, I think are, is a good thing and benefits kids. I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming tonight and presenting because I know that we kept saying we're going to have you, we're going to have you. So I'm happy that we actually have you tonight. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the um, opportunity. I definitely think that uh, Dr. Willett, if you can make this presentation available to the, um, maybe the dashboard or, you know, otherwise, because I do think there's a lot of valuable information in here. There's a lot to take in, especially with all the different programs. I did um, have a question though, uh, literacy how, now is that like a part of these other programs? Is it like a separate thing or how, because I was just wondering about that too. Sure, um, do you want me to answer that Dr. Willett? Or would you? Yes. Okay, so literacy how is not a program. Okay. Um, literacy how is a, uh, literacy how, how provides us with coaching. Uh, for our teachers and our students. So we have Christine Cohen, who has been with us now for a couple of years, and she is our coach. She is the, a coach extraordinaire. So she really does do an incredible job. And what our hope is, is that as we continue to improve our efforts, like my, I spoke a lot about SPIRE. SPIRE is a program. It's our tool though, really, that's our tool, but what we want eventually is everybody to feel so comfortable and so uh, and to feel well versed in how to use a structured literacy approach that they take that tool and follow then a problem, what's called a problem solving approach to best meet the needs of the students. So Christine is moving that needle for us. She's helping us say, okay, so Ashley needs this, this, and this but Walt needs this, this, and this. So how do I take everything that I know about SPIRE and everything that I know about structured literacy and how do I best meet, meet Ashley's needs? As we, and then separately, because not, you're not the same, so not every, every student's learning trajectory is not the same, then meet Walt's needs. So she's our coach to help us with that endeavor. So it's not a program. It's like it's training our teachers to use evidence-based methods. It's uh, increasing our own capacity so that we can do the best job possible for children. Yeah, I just didn't know if somehow it tied into the different, because I mean, Spire looked great when we did the walkthrough there. We saw um, a few students using that. Uh, my daughter was in second grade when she started the um, foundations. And I do think I do agree that with a lot of students when I was helping, it really does help break down the words and you know you get to get those basics so I mean I've definitely been impressed with uh, the programs that we have but my goodness there's so many of them <laughs> I'm like oh yeah. what is this one now <laughs> yeah so, well yeah. There, but some of them there's only you have to think about it in another way because like spellography is only grade four so if you were to take like all of word work 
there's foundations because they're for the little kids. That's for the little kids because that's yep. the way that's written. That's published for K3. Yep. Then for fourth grade, so the, here's the part that gets interesting and it gets into all the weird stuff that only somebody like me likes. You know, so there's that whole, if you think back to No Child Left Behind, everybody was supposed to be able to read by the end of third grade. Well, guess what? That didn't work. Not everybody was reading by the end of third grade. So publishers had, you know, they put out these programs that were like, all right, we'll have everybody reading by the end of their grade. Well then, so the program goes to third grade. Um, it's a, and foundations is, I'm not saying it's just in, re, in response to No Child Left Behind, but I mean, it's the nature of that type of program. It's geared toward younger kids. So then you have this gap because then kids still need to know how to read multisyllabic words. How do we all know that kids' vocabularies are not what they once were for a whole variety of reasons. So by putting in a program like spellography for fourth grade and mega words for fifth grade, what we're trying to do is create this continuum of, a voca of development for word work. So all of that kind of falls under the word work umbrella. You can think of it that way. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I liked hearing the mega words were Greek roots and I was like, <laughs> Greek, Latin, that's where we need to be. So perfect. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I'm going to go down the list here. Um, Florida? So thank you so much for this. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks. And I love seeing some of the, uh, my favorite books on that THS list. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so great, some great choices there. Um, a couple of questions about uh, literacy, how I know Ashley brought it up, but Christine is the, is she both the special ed and the general ed coach? Yes. And is and how is that working in the this pandemic time? So that's a good question. So um, she we have Christine and a, another person for the middle school whose name is um, Tara Pegliaro. So Christine is at the high school and at Birch and at TIS. And um, up until very recently, she was working in district. Um, at, and she'd spend a day at each school, obviously following all the PPE guidelines, et cetera. Uh, and so she, it, at each school, her role is a little bit different, kind of, she's, she's responsive to the needs of that school. Um, now, Tara is only at the middle school, so she's only there on Thursdays. So she just goes to the middle school on Thursdays, and again, following all the PPE protocols, she meets with um, very specific groups of teachers, not groups, I'm sorry, with teachers, not in a group, one-on-one, -on -one, scheduled throughout the day. Um, and so they have been, Tara, this is, Tara is new to, um, to um, Tallinn Public Schools this year, although she came a little bit last year too, but that's just to help Christine with the division of labor, if you will. Awesome. Thank you so much for this. I'll uh, relinquish the floor. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to Jacob. Thank you, uh, Ms. Daly Burns, for coming here and giving us this uh, nice presentation tonight. I had a couple questions. Um, my first one is just looking at this current slide about um, goals for the future. And I'm curious, you know, what, what do you see kind of has the um, the top priority for um, English and language arts, I guess, up in the coming year, besides um, COVID and adjusting things to COVID, because I, I know that's obviously going to be um, important. Great question. Thank you. For me, um, the next horizon is the middle school. Uh, as I mentioned, we have sixth grade. We have wit and wisdom being piloted this year. Uh, I really like to move it into seventh and eighth grade. It's a it's a great program that uh, we, we've had some really great results with, um, and I'd like to see that moving ahead into seventh and eighth grade next year. Uh, the uh, the one teacher who is not piloting in sixth grade this year is so impressed by what her colleagues students are doing and and the her colleagues' attitudes about it, the way she's really enjoying the program, that she said, I'm fully on board for doing it next year. Um, so that's great. Uh, I try very hard not to be heavy handed um, because I don't think that ever works well. 
to say, you, you know, you must do this or you must do that. That's not my leadership style. So what I'm, I'm hoping to do is pilot again then for seventh grade, because obviously the, the content changes, obviously, uh, dependent upon the grade and move ahead in, in, so it would be two years time, have it fully implemented, have witnessed and fully implemented at the middle school. But right now I see the middle school as the next, uh, the, the next focus, I mean, my next focus. Excellent. And uh, my second question is in a very different direction, but um, I was curious if the, uh, if the ELA department throughout the schools has any guidelines as far as like um, the appropriate use of kind of a, a film and, and movies um, in class. Um, I know from my personal experience, um, they were used up in varying various degrees up in I think sometimes it was helpful and sometimes it wasn't, but I was wondering if um, about your level, if there's any sort of plan as to how to use that medium most effectively outside of like a film studies class. Thank you. So um, from, I'll be honest, from what I know at the film studies classes at the high school, there is most definitely a, a, pro, a process in place for what films students are permitted to view. Um, I know that Mrs. Fox uh, in years prior had set up an entire process and there was a list of films that were approved um, on that. And so honestly, there's not tons of films shown at other levels, to be honest with you. Um, unless you know of something, Jacob, I'd love to hear it because um, I, there's not a ton shown at, at much beyond younger than the high school. Yeah, no, I mean, going back, you know, past high school, um, I can't think of a whole lot. Um, I guess my kind of context was, you know, in some cases, you know, watching a movie up instead of a book, give, you know, movie version of something instead of a book, you know, if um, there's any sort of kind of rational rationale about when that's beneficial versus when it might just be better to sit down and read the text, even if the text is long. Thank you. That gives me a new area to research in and get back to you on. All right. <laughs> but thanks. Yeah, thank you. No, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, let's go to Griffin. Thank you, Ashley. Um, thank you so much, um, Ms. Daly Burns, for this presentation. I admit I've been so looking forward to this for <laughs> such a long time. So um, I'm so excited to hear about all of the um, the programs, especially in our younger grades. I the you know. Yeah, at first I was kind of like Ashley, like, wow, there's there's a lot, but you know, seeing how they kind of go specific to each grade, I just think it's so important for our our young readers for their confidence and you know just uh, their success, you know, going forward to uh, you know have that those reading skills as early as possible. So that was just really um, great to see. I'm just had a quick question. So I think it was last year around this time during the um, budget workshops. I believe I was talking to um, Ms. Fox about some changes at the high school, specifically um, adding in some research writing, either a class or just um, a, a section in some of the high school English classes. I was just wondering if that was still on the table, still like in progress or, or what? Thank you for that. Yes. And it's funny you bring it up because I was talking with um, the high school uh, ELA curriculum supervisor, the uh, curriculum is on the other day and research projects came up. Um, so I know at the 10th grade level, they do have a research paper that they've tried to make sure that we, we put it in, you know, it must have been after we spoke last year when we were still doing, we did some curriculum work in the winter months prior to going out for COVID. Mm -hmm. So we were able to, to sneak it in there. And um, Dr. Willett asked me the other day just about this very topic as well, and, and the cross-section um, of social studies and research project. And he likes, obviously, humanities is a, you know, if you think of those all as the humanities, that's a great intersection there. Um, so it has not, it, it is, it has not left the horizon, if you will. It's still there. And I know that they're doing it in 10th grade. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks, thanks. Okay, let's go to Dina. Thank you, Ashley. And I apologize if I've repeated what anybody has already previously said, 
um, and him having internet issues, so I got kicked off a couple times. Um, uh, but Miss Daly Burns, I just wanted to say thank you and thank you for your time this evening. I mean, this was phenomenal. Um, it was very informative. Um, I know I'm familiar with a lot of the programs that you mentioned, and then there was some new ones that I'm very excited to hear more about. Um, to see how they've been going, uh, specifically the geodes. <laughs> that seemed excited, ex uh, an exciting program for, for the younger grades to keep them excited. Um, but what I heard from you is um, that there just isn't one tool that works, like they all kind of couple together. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, cutting one or another or losing one or gaining one, it, it's, they all kind of work in conjunction with each other. If I'm understanding what your whole presentation was, is, is that a pretty accurate, statement I mean I, I I see where you have different levels by grade obviously as they go up you know different ones designed mm -hmm. by grade level and such um, but again it seems like you can't cut one and have the same results like they really need to be intertwined is that correct? exactly so I always I use a few different thank you that's <clears throat> that's exactly so so there's a few different kind of catchphrases that I I tend to use um, if you think about that reading is a gestalt it's a whole and, but it's made up of all these different threads, all these different threads. And so we have to have all of them working together in conjunction mm -hmm. with each other to create a reading mosaic, if you will. And okay. without that, without this strand, let's pretend that strand is word work. Well, you know what we find that are, it all kind of, that strand loosens because the kids aren't getting enough direct instruction on it. And then this tight woven, gestalt that we need for reading is no longer so tight. It's kind of like that. And so that's where we see, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when you see about like 85% of adjudicated youth uh, have a reading disability, it's because these strands are not so tight. They have to be, they have to be woven tight like a rope. So when we have all of these things and they're out like this, then we have problems, you know? So Really, my job is to bring everything together and to see how all of these pieces interweave to create a strong, cohesive group. Fantastic. I mean, it's like I said, it was it was very eye opening and um, I appreciate you sharing um, with it. And there are things that, you know, that you talked about even tonight, just literacy, how specifically foundations, what a fantastic base program to really get those younger minds moving, um, just structured literacy. It's all just such crucial, crucial for all the, the students' development from K all the way through high school. So thank you again, and thank you to your team. I'm very appreciative of your time. Oh, thank Ms. you. Ben, it is like, uh, it's like all the organs of the body, you know, you can't do it without the heart or the lungs or the brain. It's really important. 2006, 2010, they really weren't. It suffered because of it. They, they literally suffered because of it. You know, it's also financial, you know, doing what we're doing under the leadership of, uh, of uh, Ms. Daly Burns here. You know, we're, we're focusing on important things, uh, I mean, awareness of phonics. If we weren't doing that, we'd also see a deep impact in things like, uh, you know, our outplacements because we would not be able to serve the students the way that we need to serve them. We would fail to do so without the excellent planning and the programs that are you know, needed and each of the things she's doing at each of these developmental level, you know, the needs of the developmental levels of each of these students at each grade level. They, they each fill a part of that. And if we don't have them, we're going to compromise our ability to adequately serve the kids and it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt them and cost us more in the long run. So it's really impressive what she has managed to do. And I'm deeply thankful to her for it. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. And Dr. Willett, I don't know if it was just my internet or not, but you sound to um, jump up and around a little bit. So I'm not sure if it's just me, though. Anybody else uh -oh. had that fluctuation in yeah, not. it was me too. I couldn't, I, you were cutting in and out pretty heavily. Yeah, so just <laughs> FYI, I was going to stop you, but then I'm like, oh, it's clear, but then it wasn't. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm going to let you know, I didn't know if it was just me too. So I was like, okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, we don't do this. We'll pay more in the long run. It's like the heart and soul of our place. It's great for kids. <laughs> if they don't have it, they'll suffer and it'll be horrible. Okay, let's go to uh, Madhu. 
Um, I just wanted to say, uh, Dana actually took my, the question that I had, like uh, that it was really all building on it on itself. And I, I just wanted to say thank you for coming and putting this together for me. And the dedication that you clearly have is is very apparent. And I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, thank you. That was it. Thank you. Okay, anyone else at this time? Well, thank you very much for coming and having the presentation. Like I said, I'm sorry it took so long to get you. It's okay. <laughs> but it's okay. Very glad that you did. <laughs> thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. And really, if anybody ever has any questions, just reach out. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dr. Willett, let's go to the um, H2 welcoming our new board members. So at this okay. Time, so this this is uh, basically just a placeholder so that we can adequately and you know do the do the appropriate step of uh, welcoming and presenting our our new board members to everyone in the public. Um, so I, I can hand the the reins over to uh, the chair for that purpose. But um, you know I'm certainly excited to have both both um, Sophia and Madhu to join us. Absolutely. And I have been hearing that, Madhu, you're already jumping into policy with, with our friend Tony over here. <laughs> I am. I am. It's actually, it's super interesting. I'm glad that, you know, um, he, he invited me onto it. Um, it's, it's an interesting learning experience seeing how everything works and the level of detail that it takes to actually run a school system. It's, it's eye-opening. Um, you know, but yeah, no, it's, it's great. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Madhu Redu Chintala. Um, you can call me Madhu. That's perfectly fine. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you for all for um, the warm welcome. Perfect. Um, Sophia, did you want to have a minute to talk about yourself a little bit? <laughs> sure. I just wanted to say thank you. I appreciate all that, all of you who reached out to me to welcome me. Um, and I'm just looking forward to working with all of you. It's very exciting. Um, I know you guys are just getting started with everything. Um, you do need to pick committees to be on. Um, I would like to kind of hear what you're feeling, what you feel like your strong points are and what you would like to be a part of. Um, you know, it doesn't- I will tell you from, from my perspective. No, I, I'm just saying, it does, you know, you could take some time too because I found out that I don't need to make official appointments in a board. Um, meeting. So if you want to think about it for a little bit and just really kind of test it and just go to meetings and just kind of seeing what you would like to do, no problem. You want to join, you like, you know, like I said, I know Madhu was like gung ho with, the, yeah. with Tony on there. So if you want, like no problem, um, whatever you guys feel comfortable with, I don't want to, you know, push you into anything. Check out your schedules when the meetings are going. Um, Dr. Willett, that was another question I wanted to ask you. For this upcoming year, are the uh, subcommittee meetings at the same time that they were this year, or can they change? Uh, you just uh, when we look to change them, we just have to change them moving forward. Whatever we publish, you know, we would change them for the entire year if you wanted to. Okay, because that was one of the questions that I had for you, and I forgot to ask you at one of the times that we were talking about. Um, board so meetings. I will tell you, I, I had some ideas of what I wanted to do, but I can reach out to you in private. And you know, um, I mean, whatever, that, right? whatever you feel comfortable with, because I mean, honestly, things like I said, the only one that is really, really full is the FFC. But, you know, if there's someone that wants to come off or on or, you know what I mean? Like, we just need to just work together and just find where you want to work with and we can get you on there and get ready to Perfect. go. Yeah, no, yeah. I'll reach out to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. I'll reach out as well. Thank you so much. No problem. Because like I said, I found out I didn't have to do it in a board room. And like, I don't want you guys signing up for something and saying, why did I sign up <laughs> before? So if you want to attend meetings too, and just get a feel for it and see how you, you know, mesh with it, that's fine as well. Just let me know. It's not a, not a big deal, but thank you guys. And I'm looking forward to working with you and it's, just, it's exciting. Um, let's see, Plord. I was just going to say, you guys can pick more than one. <laughs> <laughs> it's always welcome to pick more than one. I, I moved over to communications if anyone wants to join me. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it's a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Dana. 
Um, yes, I just didn't, um, yeah, I know that uh, Madhu and Sophia are gonna be fantastic on whichever committee or committees or one of four committees like I'm on. <laughs> I've taught, I've teased them about my multiple committees. Um, but nevertheless, I think they're gonna be a valuable asset on any committee. So I'm excited to hear what, you know, we kind of arrive on. Um, the other question that I had is um, because of the vacancies of the chair position on the curriculum committee and the vacancy of the chair position on the communications committee when it, when Ms. Howard Bender and Ms. Moran um, resigned, you had appointed interim um, chairs. So um, once Madhu and Sophia kind of decide where they land at that point, is that something that we are gonna talk about as a board, um, who the permanent chairs will be and what the permanent aligned committees will be or how are we gonna proceed with that? Yeah, no, I think we can see exactly where they feel, where they wanna go, um, just see exactly what spot because obviously there's definitely been some people who have a game plan of what their committees are doing. So we really just have to take it and see where everybody fits in. It's just a puzzle piece, that's all. So I guess my question would be is when they do um, find out when we get aligned, when they are appointed to committees at that point, are we going to assign permanent chairs for those respective yeah. committees versus the quote unquote interim? Well, yeah, what I found now. out is that I can appoint people every week if I wanted to just switch them out. I mean, it really just depends on what the feel is and what the flow is. And there's nothing that has anything written in sand, like um, written in stone saying, this is what you have to do. So if people feel like they want to shuffle, if they want to move. And so at that point, it's it's open to everyone. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, my question's not being answered. I, I apologize. It's you, you nominated no, interim I, chairs. So are yeah. they permanent chairs now is what you're saying? And they're not interim chairs. Is that correct? I had to put chairs on there so that the committees could still meet without the chair. Right, I understand that. Yeah. And But on your email, it was interim chairs. Uh -huh. So I'm asking is, are now they permanent chairs? I'm just asking for clarification. We're gonna have to see exactly what committees that everyone's gonna wanna be on. That's all. So I can't I, answer your question without knowing where everybody's moving. Right, but at the end of the day, there's going to be a permanent chair chairing a committee and I want to make sure that we do have those appointed that's all I'm asking so if you're saying that it's going to be always in the air then that's not very it's not always consistent. in the air until everyone picks what committees they would like I don't know why it's a an issue because like I said let's find out what committees they want to be on because without having that mm -hmm. I mean depending on what they are doing and maybe someone else would like to move from another committee and make changes. Right. No, it's not an issue. I'm just asking so I can understand. Yeah. No. Because just... we had two minority caucus members as chairs of committees. And right now, every single committee, whether it's an interim chair or a permanent chair, is a majority caucus member. So the big thing that the minority caucus has been desperately reaching out to this team is to ensure that, you know, we have a seat at the table and that we're a part of the conversation. I think having bipartisan um, chair committee chairs is paramount. Um, so when you sent out the email, and yes, it does not need to be assigned via, via uh, a meeting. However, I wanna make sure that your email that you sent out on November 3rd stating that you have interim chairs that in fact, when everybody is assigned to the committees and our newest members are assigned, it's something that we can discuss because I think it is the right thing to do by the Board of Ed. I think it's the right do, thing to do by our constituents. And I think it's the right thing to do for us as a team. I'm not trying to be troublesome. I'm just trying to make sure that I understand because I just don't. And, and technically, honestly, what I found out with uh, Dr. Willa is that I didn't have to technically call them interim chairs because I can change them every week if I wanted to. Okay. You're, you're getting defensive. I'm not trying to be argumentative. Yeah, I'm no, trying to I'm, understand. Just, I'm just letting you know, like what I have found out through this process. So, okay. you well, know, thank you for letting me know. I appreciate that communication. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, Sophia and Madhu, like I said, if you could just you know, think about it, look at the schedules and get back to me, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Willett, let's go to um, H3, the monthly financial report. Okay. Okay, so I'm just sharing the screen. You should be seeing um, 
basically the monthly financial report H2. Uh, I'm just, uh, you know, at basic, the basic uh, rundown of it to keep it succinct is that the business manager provides us a report every month with respect to uh, where we are in the budget. It's included in the budget packet, as you'll find. It is the fourth month of the fiscal year. At this point, the budget balance is $1.9 million, 1907775. Um, there are still uh, parts of that being moved over and converted into encumbrances. Uh, we do include every month a financial report that um, illustrates the movement of uh, funds and expenditures of funds over the last month. The 1,000,009 represents about 4.77% of the board's budget. I'm going to segue over to that monthly report right now. I'll blow up the screen so that hopefully you can, you can see as much of it as possible. And I'll give you a, a basic rundown. Um, of, of where we are. So salaries are currently under budget. Uh, additional hiring of teachers and paras is still ongoing. Uh, we do have, you know, we've had some transition. The uh, COVID year has caused some of that. And so we're still working through it. Uh, current available balance is 341,000. And the balance has fluctuated um, largely because of the pandemic right now. And we're hoping, you know, that it'll stabilize as we go through the rest of the year. The substitute budget also 326 um, under budget. And uh, you know that's not totally uncommon. It is the beginning of the year. And I do see that we'll probably be utilizing those funds quite a bit this year. Um, as obviously substitutes you know, will be needed for a variety of reasons. And uh, you know, I expect that to, to balance out at the end. Overtime expenses cannot be encumbered. They're currently under budget at 124,000. This number is down from last month um, by about 23. I do expect that we're going to be using overtime uh, quite a bit this year as we you know, uh, stretch and bend to, to make things happen um, with a lot of unusual you know, things that, that just are gonna be a part of dealing with uh, you know, COVID with snow and COVID with other things. Uh, stipends are currently over budget this year. Pay to play has been reduced from 200 to $100 to help families also because you know, the sports seasons have been modified. Um, there's not as much we're able to offer. So the amount that we are charging has been lowered, but that will affect our bottom line. You know, uh, try to keep in mind that in prior years, the budget stipends, um, you know, have been encumbered. So that generally will uh, affect that line item. The, the pay to play funds are not fully collected um, until the very end of the season. We try to give families as much time as we can and so we still are in a process of, of still collecting. Um, the pay to play funds are also, um, you know, they, as I said, they're down. So that's gonna make that, that budget line probably look a little, little more uh, negative in, um, than it typically does. But it is negative when we have not fully collected pay to play funds anyway. Uh, health insurance, Everance, employee benefits are collectively under budget right now. We're at the beginning of the year though. We do expect that to kind of move up um, about 233 under. The newly hired employees and retired employees, you know, that's going to affect some of the FICA, the Med, and Social Security, newly and, and hired and employed, and some people that have retired since the beginning of the year, and that can change the balances, and we have had fluctuations this year due to the situation that we're in. Available balance is about 137, 137,000 under budget. Um, retirement course and reimbursement and unemployment expenses are collectively under budget, but it is October. Um, this, is a, this is the October report. Um, there is an increase in unemployment um, expenses, and that's generally due to the, the coronavirus situation. Benefits consultants and workers comp are on target as of uh, October. Legal, audit, and tech services are collectively under for 194. Um, this number is down from last month, about 77. The district will be negotiating with the paraprofessionals, as you know, we're in that process, and uh, secretary union negotiations will start in 2021. So we're going to see the expenses on these lines increase as the year progresses. Um, and legal audit tends to do that anyway, as, as you know. Uh, repair, maintenance, custodial cleaning, equipment, technical, um, these continue to be spent as the year progresses. You know, we do expect to, to see that moving pretty aggressively forward because obviously we're working very hard to keep the schools in the best possible position. And Pete Staba doing an amazing job. You know, he constantly just makes it work as well as uh, all the facility staff, you know, Paul, Ernie, and all the custodians um, doing an amazing job. 
Um, so, you know, there has been an increase in the expenses resulting from supply costs and materials and building needs um, with respect to COVID. Transportation is over budget by 117,000. The majority of this is due to some additional out of district transportation. Uh, that does happen. Um, that does also fluctuate as the year goes on. So, um, you know, things like athletic transportation being under budget um, due to those schedules that can cause some balancing. But, um, you know, that also relates to how much we collect. So we're going to see some fluctuations in those budgets this year, as you might expect, because there, there are things that change throughout the year um, in transportation and, and so on. Uh, energy expenses have been transferred to the Universal Internal Service Fund, which is a typical process. And textbooks are not fully expended, as you might imagine. We still are in November. They're currently under budget by about 63000 but we do expect the curriculum supervisors to spend that. Um, and, uh, you know, throughout November, December, January, February, that's usually when that's happening. <laughs> Instructional supplies and miscellaneous experiences, uh, supplies, sorry. <clears throat> General supplies are under budget by 302, um, but that's really because we're in November. Um, we do expend, you know, that throughout the year and we do expect to expend it at the end. Um, and the new instructional equipment line is over by 311,000, but that is because we did the purchase of the district-wide you know, uh, initiative for technology and the ERF will backfill that as will some other uh, grant money that's coming in. So we can expect that to uh, stabilize as we move forward and those funds become available and transferred back into the budget. Um, I think that's, uh, that's about it. Okay, uh, let's go to the board members for questions. Uh, Dana. I'm sorry, my hand's still up from before. <laughs> sorry. Let's go to Christina Plord. Forgive me if this was asked in FFC or, or asked already in a board meeting. Are we looking at the COVID related expenses and are, are they on the sheet or are they being itemized differently so we can get reimbursement either from our COVID relief fund or, you know, from at the government? Some, we're, at, we're at the last time I looked in the $150,000 range. We do, you know, probably 170 if I had to think about it right now. Um, we do have 283. That's part of the 40% that we transferred over to the town. I know the town was considering that COVID fund, uh, the 30-40-30 split was what we had ended with at the end of last year. And that 40 was about 283 um, that the town was going to do a coronavirus relief fund for the schools with. So we're still under that amount, but uh, you know, as you might imagine, it, it's creeping up. And um, we, have, we have designated you know, where, where those expenditures are. They're not fully reflected in one place on this sheet, but they do add up to about a 170 as of November, and we'll probably, you know, be using that 283 as we get through the year. So we can easily pull that data to have in one spot eventually when we need it. I guess that's my question. Yeah, the expenditures yeah. come from a lot of different areas, so it, it can, you know, it can be, you know, aggregated. Yes, okay. not necessarily easily, but yes, you know, we we, we can aggregate it, of course. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay, let's go to Tony. Yeah, and um, looking at this, while it brings to mind some of the conversations we we're having in policy, but did I understand correctly? So you're saying each of these line items uh, rolls into it a couple of other things that are discussed more fully in FFC? Yeah, you know, the, the report that we give um, at, at a monthly report has these lines. I think traditionally people have seen these lines as quite a few, um, but as with any budget like this, um, there are there are many lines that roll into a line. That, you know, anything you put on one page, there are other budgets that go under it. Um, so you see the 110, 120, 130. You know, those some of those have sub budgets. Salaries is um, you know made up of all of the different salaries of the different groups in the district. So it just gets conglomerated here in that one line but it's broken down into the various other groups. And so there are, there are lines that are rolled up. And that's what FFC generally looks at in more detail. They do have you know, an extended amount of time so they can do that. And then you know, we, we usually questions that come up out of a board meeting like this will then be uh, you know, further developed or 
uh, further extrapolated upon an FFC. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Yep. Okay, let's go to Jacob. Okay, uh, real quick. So maybe you covered this and I missed it, but uh, the tuition education agency line, um, which is the account 560, um, I noticed that our balance has dropped quite a bit from the last report. Um, I was just wondering if you expected that to stabilize soon or if that might go negative. Um, I think we're probably going to see um, that it'll go over budget in the next few months. And then as the district continues to sort of uh, figure out how we're going to manage some of the situations we're in, um, you know, we may see it then come back into a balance. But, you know, uh, as we're looking to provide specialized services for the students in the district that need it, uh, we have to adapt to the conditions that we're given. And this is a tough year. So, you know, you have to fulfill IEPs regardless of the methodology. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I do expect to see some fluctuations, particularly in this year on that. Okay, that might be a little bit volatile. Okay, thank you. Any other board members at this time would have any questions for Dr. Willett on the monthly financials? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Willett, for that. And we can go on to the um, the 2020 uh, tuition rates. Yep. So moving to the tuition rates, at this time you should see on your screen that item agenda of H3. Um, as per Board Policy 3070, <clears throat> approved on January 2005, we set tuition rates and present those tuition rates to the Board of Education. Uh, the tuition rates are generally, um, you know, if a person was going to be coming into the district, you know, these are roughly the, the numbers that we would be providing in terms of what, what would have to be compensated for. So as you can see from the item, um, they're not for a specialized program per se, um, but they have their, you know, we could have a specialized program that might have rates that are different than this, but these are presented in general terms as to, you know, what we, we would expect to pay under the programs that you see here currently. If we created a new program, it might have a different tuition rate. So the point of mentioning that is that, you know, this, this applies generally to the, to the programs that you see here. But if we had another specialized program for a specialized purpose, these rates may fluctuate a bit. We may charge more for such a thing. Um, so, you know, this is to give a baseline. And uh, under the policy, it, it is um, provided to the board so that the board has a chance to review it. Will this be um, something that we need to vote on next meeting? I am going to uh, check on that. I think that in this meeting we're reviewing and the next meeting could be the, uh, there would be a recommended action to accept them. But generally it is something we, we do every, you know, every cycle so that we set them in stone. So uh, yeah, this is just a first read on it. I'll let you know if, if uh, you know, I'll check to make sure um, that we take the appropriate action for next time. Oh, perfect. Um, Madhu? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Will. Um, can you tell me how we come up with these rates? Like what's the, the what data comes in that, that, that tells us what it is that these rates, that would equal this, these rates? Yeah, we usually, to, you know, to, to give an example in special education, we go back and look at what the trend has been for um, what, you know, what we've charged or what, what has been incurred. And we then provide a, a figure that that, um, that is based on that actual expenditure trend, but also includes a percentage increase to absorb any fluctuations that we might have. So, you know, this is, these are generally set forward as a number that would never hurt the district, um, but that, uh, you know, would provide the district an ample amount of compensation if we were to receive a child that you know, needed to be educated, but wasn't necessarily part of our system. So for instance, there are times when students may be placed here by the state and you know, we would seek a, a reimbursement level that you know, would, be, uh, would be consummate with what we have as actual expenditure experience. But there is a, a percentage increase we're allowed to build in um, because there are fluctuations you know, from child to child and that's meant to cover it. 
So it, um, you know, we, you'll notice if you were to look back, this is a slightly lower figure uh, for special education than we've had in the past, um, but it's based on experience. It's based on what we incurred. Okay, thank you. Sure, of course. Okay, uh, Jacob? Uh, do you know off the top of your head about how many students Dr. Willett um, take advantage of this program and, and pay into Holland schools? Um, I can, off the top of my head, I would say that there are two, well, there's really two ways to answer that question. One is, um, is cost avoidance, you know, how, how our programs prevent us from having to pay this to someone else, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, we create programs that mean that we keep kids in district that we don't have to pay money like this out to another place. So that's an important piece of the picture for us in Thailand is having the appropriate programs and having uh, cost avoidance, be, you know, be the factor. But I would say that, you know, we usually will get a handful of kids that are transferring in from other programs. I do feel like we have uh, we've had some good experience over the last few years where, where that's been more than it has in the distant past. But we, um, you know, we generally, you know, you're looking at about a handful of kids, depending on how you look at it. You know, if you look at the, at the um, you know, our transition academy, for instance, uh, there are kids that would, that would come into that or that would not be using other programs because we offer it. And that's a good example of some, you know, cost avoidance while providing a really quality program. And then there are other times when students are placed in our district, and I would say there's two or three in the last year I can remember that, you know, for one point, at one point or another, were placed here and, you know, we charged an amount for the time that they were here. Sometimes they're not here for a whole year, so a portion of it would be charged in that case. Um, so I would say off the top of my head, three to five, you know, but um, it can fluctuate. Okay, but a fairly small scope. Yeah, most of it, like talc, or, those are mostly Talon children. Um, and, and so in this way, you know, the, a lot of what our focus, our focus has been is cost avoidance versus recruitment. That was really more of a second stage thing for us. Okay, thank you. Yep, of course. Okay. Anyone else at this time? Nope. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Willett, for this, and um, we'll find out if we have to have a board action on it next time. Yep. So let's move to the mental health, the town council committee. Um, we do have uh, Tammy and John Reagan on tonight. So I know that we left off with um, some questions. So I don't know if um, either of you two would like to address any of the questions that the board members had, and we can just kind of um, discuss where we're at with it because I know that you guys have um, voted to make the task force and you're essentially looking for three members they don't need to be appointed but they just need to really want to get to work. <laughs> hey so yeah John and I are both on. Um, Ashley you might need to refresh me on which questions were outstanding but um, uh, as far as the appointments and such, we have sent out our first communication to all the residents asking for people who are interested. Uh, we're expecting to hear back from people through the month of November, and then interviews will start in December. Um, from the board, you can have up to three, doesn't have to be three, but up to three people um, from the Board of Ed that want to be on the um, task force. And we're expecting, um, after interviews in that, hopefully that the task force would be formed and started in um, January at that point. So um, I don't recall all the questions that were outstanding. So I don't know if you wanna um, go through that. I think, I think there was a couple of things. So you're looking for a timeline of January. What is the, the meeting schedule gonna be kind of? They're like gonna have to decide that once it's uh, put together. Um, once the task force is put together and a chairperson is assigned, they'll go through and assign uh, the uh, meeting schedule. Okay. Um, I know that there were questions in regards to how the current group was going to work with the group that was already set up through- um... The LPC. Yes. Yes. So um, the LPC is an area that will be interviewed and um, talked to to find out 
what's going on, uh, what's, what services are available, what we're seeing in the town and all of that. Um, that will be one of the interaction, one of the interactive points with the uh, task force. So um, it will not be working with the LPC, but kind of looking at what the LPC does and what services they offer. Okay. Um, I'll open it up to board members for questions at this time too. Um, or if you just have a comment or question, um, that would be the time to ask. Tony? Uh, Ashley, this question may be a bit more for you, but if, I mean, if I'm hearing uh, what Ms. Nuccio is saying, two to three board members could be a part of this. If we are interested, I mean, how do we get our name in the hat? How do we, how do we voice that interest? I think you can voice it right now, Tony. I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, I, like I said, it's definitely something that we just need to find, like you said, two to three people who would be willing to do this. Um, I don't want to put anybody's plate full, um, but I do think it is a great program to try to get up and see what's happening in our community. And it's just a different angle to look through it. Um, so yeah, so you are interested, Tony. <laughs> I, I see an incredible amount of value in this and yeah, would like to be a part of it. Okay. Um, Madhu? I would also like to express my interest. So okay. I'm voicing my interest now. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Jacob? Yeah, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but I, I'm also interested up in this committee. Okay. Uh, Sophia? Myself as well. And I also have a question for Ms. Nuccio. How is, does the committee plan to implement um, any programs with the school or buttress the, what the school already has in place? What is the plan with respect to um, the board and the school with this committee? Okay, so um, right now it's it's a task force, not a committee. So um, first and foremost, this group is going to get together, uh, and their uh, their mission is to basically understand what is being offered in the town, in the schools, in the town side, everything, kind of what's out there, what's being offered and what we're seeing from the community. The second piece of that is um, holding some community talks uh, or workshops or something, I believe, to kind of get a, a feel for what the community would like to see. And then evaluating whether or not we have those resources right now in the town, whether it be in the school or the town council, whatever. But the end goal of it would be to come back with a recommendation to the town council on um, what, what you found, what you learned, and what you think either we have or don't have, and um, suggestions on um, how we could kind of fill that gap. And then it's up to the town council to take those recommendations and see how we can work them in to the budget, or if it's just, um, you know, we might come away and find out that, you know, we've got all these great resources and um, they're there. And the problem is, is just that not a lot of people know about them. So maybe it's just a, a website communication issue. Um, maybe it comes back and says, we need two new resources, one on the town side, one on the school side to do A, B, and C or to meet these gaps. So all of that would kind of be um, vetted out with the task force. And in the end, it's gonna be a presentation and a uh, reflection back to the town council of what the people in town say we need and what we have. Thank you so much for that clarification. No problem. Right. Not, right. Did I get anything wrong? No, that sounds good. It's essentially, they don't have any power to do any kind of implementation at all. It's just an evaluation and a recommendation, and then uh, the town council will, will decide how to how to respond to it. They may say, "I appreciate that." That I clearly misunderstood. So thank you. Yep. They they may say you're doing everything that you can do, or they or they may say, you know, maybe we need a licensed alcohol and drug counselor to be available full time in town. And then at that point, the town council would have to decide if it can be budgeted, how it will be budgeted. Um, but th the goal is to just to have them do an evaluation and then make a recommendation, say, this is what we think you guys need to, to better address this issue. And <clears throat> it's clearly been exacerbated by the pandemic. So the need is always there, but it's, it's, the need is even greater these days because of the pandemic and the isolation that the pandemic has caused. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I work um, for a company that manufactures a medication that treats alcohol and opioid use disorders. And um, 
yeah, so I'm talking to treatment centers all the time. I'm talking to mental health providers all the time and, and substance use <laughs> and medical providers every day. So I wouldn't necessarily say I'm an expert, but I do have a, a lot of uh, many years of experience in, in dealing with treatment centers and, and healthcare professionals in, in these fields. So um, the need is clearly there and uh, we, we just want to do an evaluation and, and see if there's anything more that we can do as a community to address it. It does sound like the task force, once you guys get that meeting and you go through and you have that perspective that the town council itself, um, would you create a committee after this to come up with a recommendation? Is, you know, cause I know, understand that this is just like the task force to see, you know, what the problem is, how to, you know, maybe resolve it. But once you take that step and you have that recommendation, are you planning on creating a committee to if that's, what they, if that's what they recommend, they, they may they may come back and, and recommend you need a you need a permanent committee to deal with this on an ongoing basis, and then at that point a decision will be made as to whether or not to create a, a committee that will be permanent, kind of like the committee on disabilities that was created earlier in this term. So we we really don't know. We don't we we don't. I lost John. Did it, anyone else? <laughs> John, I cannot hear a word. Your mouth is going, but I cannot hear anything. <laughs> well, I, I think what he's trying to get at is, um, you know, we do have the LPC in town. So this, they might come back with ways for us to strengthen or augment the current LPC, or they might, as John said, come back and say, you know, we need more direct focus on this. And we need, um, you know, we would like to have a commission to be in, in for so long. You know, honestly, we don't know where it's going to go. We just know that this is an ask by the community. It's one that we absolutely support, one that we think um, there's definitely a need for. And we're asking for as many hands on deck to help us try to solve um, the, the issues that we have. Great. And one thing to keep in mind is this, this uh, task force will not be dealing with people who have these issues. No. So the, the professionals are there that can, that can deal with these folks. But it, so there won't be any privacy concerns. People are not going to contact this task force and say, I need help with a substance use problem or, or a mental health issue. This is just to evaluate resources that are currently there. Yeah, there's not going to be any um, individual like talking about John Doe had this and, and Jane Smith had that. You know, this is more resource driven, overarching um, mental health, substance use issues, resources that the town has, resources that the town doesn't have, um, you know, and mainly really our our residents um, experiences, right? what's happened with them being able to find help or ask for help or, you know, that kind of a thing. When, when we have that second piece of it, it's really going to be for them to express what they would like to see in town or um, what they have experienced or haven't experienced as resources available to them. Right. And how so long do you feel that this is going to progress? Like how long do you feel that this task force will be um, digging in and going through? I really honestly feel for them to do it justice. You know, again, this is just an estimate and I, I don't wanna be held like my feet to the fire for this number, but I really think it's gonna be um, a minimum of six months. If you think about the amount of meetings that people need to have and the research that needs to be done and talking to the staff and doing all of that stuff. I, I imagine that this is going to be a fairly heavy lift. Um, and just in my own mind, going through like plotting through the time, I'm thinking it's going to be about six months, which actually would be kind of perfect because it would get us to the end of this fiscal year and it would get us right back in time for budget season. So when we get the recommendations, if we get the recommendations by the end of summer, then we can start looking at what we can do and then the budget season to address the issues that may or may not be present. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, do any other board members have any other questions at this time? No? Okay, so you said uh, two to three. Oh, Dana? Uh, Dana's doing a physical hand up. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not feeling awesome. Um, no, I just wanted to thank uh, Ms. Nucci and Mr. Reagan for their time today. I think um, hearing what they had to say was 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 very eye opening. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing um, which board members would like to join the, the task force, and I look forward to seeing you know what they're doing. Um, and uh, John, I'd like to bend your ear about what you do professionally at another time. It's just it was quite interesting listening to you speak this evening. So thank you. 
Anytime. He's a peach. <laughs> He's oh, always going to help. <laughs> okay. Um, as you said, I don't have to appoint anyone, but you know, I like that we have bright-eyed, bushy-tailed people ready to go <laughs> from doing Sophia. So to me, I think uh, Tony and Jacob, um, you guys decide <laughs> which one out of you two are going to uh, join because, like I said, I'm you know everyone's been on on. Uh, committees and other task force and everything else so I think we uh get some new blood in there and get that going so <laughs> Jacob and Tony you decide which one of you are gonna go <laughs> nothing like crickets <laughs> Oh, right now. Well, you have time. You don't have to do it right yeah. now. You know, like you've got, like Ashley, you've got four people who are interested if they want to talk about it and figure it out, um, you know, between the four of them. You know, you don't, you have basically, we're not going to start doing the interviews until, um, until the, uh, until the December timeframe. So. Okay, perfect. And um, if you have any questions in terms of this, um, I'll have them reach out to you guys to uh, figure out any other additional things. So perfect. Well, see, there you go. Two to three. We got four that want to go and, and join. <laughs> so, well, and you know, well, hopefully we won't have to go to that far, but we have to see uh, how many residents we're hoping to have it more heavily resident based. So that's why we said up to three. You know, if if um, if we get three, that's great. If we didn't get three, we were going to throw an extra residence. So, you know, if we don't get enough residents, then maybe we can take four, <laughs> you know, but we'll see how that plays out in December. And just a question, how many residents are you looking for? We're looking for this task force to be 11 people with two alternates. One has to be from the faith-based or um, community. Three are gonna be from the town council. Three are gonna be from, oh, up to three town council, up to three board of ed. So that's seven. At that point, we would have um, four regular and two alternative um, residents. And we've asked for the residents to have some sort of professional experience in either mental health or substance use. Um, and like I said, if, if we get 25 people that have applied, they're all really qualified. Maybe we go down to two town council and two board of ed so we can get more professionals on there. It's kind of like a, a fail safe. We knew that we needed probably, we needed 11 people to really be able to kind of break it up into, um, two groups. So to have the chairperson and then have a group of five that's focused on the mental health with crossover of, of substance use and then five focused on substance use with any crossover to mental health. So that was the logic behind the 11 um, and then the two, the two alternates. So um, I'm hoping we get as big of a turnout as we did for the Commission of um, Persons with Disabilities because we had a lot of people apply for that one. Um, we had an excellent group of people to go through and pick from. So I'm hoping we get um, as big. I did reach out to Mike today to see if we'd gotten any applications. I think he's on vacation. So I told him, you know, don't don't get back to me until, you know, Monday. <laughs> so I know, I'd be curious to see, because I know something was posted at one point about this, mm -hmm. looking for people. So I just was curious as to what the community, how it's been taken. So I'll let you guys know when I find out. That'll be good to know. Okay, any other questions? No. Thank you both very much for your help and answering any questions. So we'll no be in touch. <laughs> okay, Dr. Willett. Um, well, actually, um, it's a policy, so I'm not sure if uh, Tony's, oh, Plord's hand is up. Plord. I was just wondering if you'd entertain a motion to go past 10. Yes. Christina Plourd, I'll entertain a motion, or I'll make a motion to go past 10 o'clock. Dana Philbin, second. Okay, let's do a roll call. Uh, Plourd. Aye. Jacob. Aye. Madhu. Aye. Rini. Yeah, aye. Tony. Aye. Griffin. Aye. Sophia. Aye. <laughs> Sophia. Aye. Okay, I'm I as well. We will go past 10. Thank you, Plord, for seeing the clock. My clock is not even on my screen right now. Um, so our next business is the uh, to update policy 5140. I know Tony gets very excited. So Dr. Willa, I don't know if you want to or Tony, but. Well, I'll just, I'll, I'll throw a couple words in and then let uh, Mr. Holt kind of carry it the rest of the way. 
This is uh, 5140 is basically the student use uh, district computer systems and internet. You know, this is one of the um, boilerplate ones we're trying to update, just make it more current, um, you know, listing the most currently used uh, equipment and technology, updating the language as per uh, what Chipman and Goodwin has, uh, has in their model policy. And um, so you'll just see that the red is the strikeout and the blue is the replacement language um, with a highlighted modified replacement language here that extends um, the statement to you know, suggest that we have the reserve the right to monitor the use of and to restrict access, not just monitor the use of. So um, that's that's basically it, Mr. Holt. I don't know if uh, just a just a quick just to dovetail on what Dr. Willett is saying uh, there that we prioritized this one specifically because you know while there are many that need to be updated and, and brought up to speed with every that's going on with the COVID situation, the distance learning, and the obvious move towards higher technology in our, in our schools, uh, we wanted to be able to put the things into place to protect and to utilize these systems correctly. Uh, so while the policy that you're seeing here has very high level and, and simplistic changes, the intent was to provide that cover fire so that the regulation, the district then uh, takes from this is able to do what we need to. And the regulation is included here too for the, the board's perusal. The regulations are usually done you know, by administrative staff that and they're the more detailed version of what the policy kind of lays out. So the policy lays out the generalities and usually the regulation gives you the specifics. Okay, at this time, okay, I like this is just a first read. Uh, so no action will be required this week. I just wanted to see if any board members had any questions in terms of what is here. Okay, I think we can uh, move forward. Let's go to the uh, committee and liaison reports. Um, I know policy has been busy. So if you would like to start us off, Tony. Excellent, thank you, Madam Chair. So the policy committee has met twice uh, since our last meeting. We met last week and then today. Uh, as Madhu brought up earlier, we were pleased to have him join us for both of these. I can honestly say that the conversations were the better because of each and every voice that we had. Uh, just a quick run through. Uh, as you've just seen, 5140, the student use of district and computer systems. Uh, this policy is out of committee and sub submitted for the first read. We discussed 9160, which is meeting conduct. Discuss the discussion centered around changing the policy from telephonic participation to remote participation, utilizing technologies comparable to Zoom. Uh, the wonderful discussion led to even more questions Thus the table, the topic was tabled to allow time to research and bring information uh, back to the committee. We discussed 9170 uh, quorum and voting procedure. Discussion focused specifically on the use of straw polls. I was noted in 9160, it stated that Robert's rules of order shall govern the proceedings of the board, except as otherwise provided by these bylaws. Since Robert's rules state that the straw poll is not an acceptable tool calling them meaningless and dietary committee decision was to leave policies as they stand. And if use of straw polls is desired, then the policy can be revisited. 9100, uh, minor modifications were made to align the policy with respective uh, its respective town policy. That one is on, uh, what was that Dr. Willett, the revision or uh, replacements? And then 3010, uh, we began today, began a robust discussion focused on ensuring uh, that our policy correctly articulates efforts going on without becoming a burden upon district actions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, perfect. Um, I believe there was a Birch Grove, Dana, correct? Um, it was an exciting meeting last night. 
a ton of, um, well, we had our construction update. Um, so there has been some stuff that has been moving um, pretty fluidly um, and we're ahead of schedule in some aspects of the construction update, um, which is good because in other aspects, you know, with everything going on with COVID manufacturing and production plants and such, there's there's concerns of getting materials in time. And instead of getting multiple truckloads of materials, you may be only getting one truckload. But on, on the other end, again, there's some things that we're way ahead of uh, on the construction update. So there are some things simply because of the unsuitable soil situation um, that the committee tabled back in late May, early June to talk about if we were gonna have them in the budget or out of the budget. Um, we are now starting to have some of those conversations about if we should approve these things and put them back in the budget since we aren't paying the tab of the unsuitable soils, if you will. Um, so one of those, for example, without going into the minutia, uh, one of those things, for example, was the wardrobes um, having, and I hate that they're called wardrobes and Dr. Willett, you can probably clarify, but they're storage cabinets for the teacher's spaces. So there's three storage spaces or wardrobes, if you will, per room, and they talked about taking away one. And we have multiple educators on the Birch Grove Committee, which is fantastic. And their answer was, you take away a wardrobe a teacher is gonna buy something to fit in that space, i.e. a plastic cabinet from Target or the cubes from Target or, or what have you that's not gonna be necessarily safe. Um, so Mr. Saba, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was like a $4,000 tab for Tolland, Dr. Willett for that third mm -hmm. wardrobe. So that's something that we're looking at discussing simply just because the unsuitable soils is not, no longer gonna be on our tab, if you will. Um, they went through a whole presentation um, with the FF&E and technology um, and how JCJ and the team are, are working with, um, and CAP are working with the teachers and educators to ensure that they have the proper furnitures and fixtures and such in the respective classrooms. Um, and so we'll have a little bit more of a timeline for our next meeting on that. Uh, and then we did a process a few change orders of things that needed to be um, addressed with the construction update. Um, but other than that, it's, it's looking good. And I, I'm not sure of what the timeline was, but we did have a few, uh, a couple meetings ago, they had a walkthrough and not everybody was able to attend on every Birch Grove committee member. So D'Amato Construction has opened up um, walkthroughs. So on, I don't know, it was a Saturday that they, I, myself, as well as two other members were able to walk through um, the facility and it looks phenomenal. Um, so I'm hoping to get some pictures so I can share them with you guys. Um, the gym slash cafeteria is mind blowing. Absolutely mind blowing. Um, and we're, uh, we, I was talking to Eugene and uh, Katie Murray, the chair, and they're talking about um, setting up a time for the entire board to do a walkthrough um, for that mock room that I've talked to you guys about, um, some different things, but uh, it's absolutely, I mean, if you can, Imagine copper, steel, piping, PVC being breathtaking. It's breathtaking. It's really amazing what these folks are doing um, for the for our, the youngest students of Tolland. Um, and just some of the updates that they've done and just listening to um, Allison Skinner, who's a teacher um, who is on it, and Linda Rallo, who's a teacher on it, listening to them speak and talk and teach in, in terms of a teacher's aspect of what the school is going to provide our educators is just a wonderful thing. So I look forward to um, telling you guys about the day when, when we can have a, a um, board of ed meeting in a walkthrough in the, in the New Birch Grove. And that's what we have. That's exciting. That's cool that they're opening it up and you can take a tour and actually visualize, see what's happening. And the wardrobe, I thought that the wardrobe, as I went to the meeting, but we have the wardrobes at Birch Grove as they were in the back of the room. Is that kind of what the wardrobe is? So what it is is, so there's, there's some stuff that you're talking about up top. And I think they're talking about eliminating that high up stuff okay. because it's not safe to get up there. But the wardrobes, it's, it's more of like a closet structure, if you will. Um, and there's three of them currently in the rooms. They have not been eliminated. It was one of the topics, if we were gonna to have to pay for the unsuitable soils, eliminating one or so. Um, so 
I again, Dr. Willa could probably speak a little bit more intelligently. I hate that they call it a wardrobe because it sounds so bougie, you know, I mean, so fancy. Yeah, one of the things the teachers really have needed, and, and they will tell you they needed, and they really, mm -hmm. it was one of the things that was a priority to them was this space. Because right. the little the little people have lots of little things and they, mm -hmm. they put them everywhere. And so, you know, it is something that they highlighted as one of the most important things. And I'm glad to see that the committee is able to give it that attention. I was unable to uh, tune in, I usually do, um, but I wasn't able to do it this week due to you know, some contact tracing stuff we had to do. But I know that this has been on the radar for a while. I'm very, very thankful to see that um, it's being considered again and i know the teachers will appreciate it yes it was something that was that was discussed deeply because the yeah like you said dr well the educators um you know our consultants are really listening to our educators of what they need so this has been a push and this is one of those things that's ahead of production so again it's been kind of pushed up on our plate simply because you know the production's ahead of time so it's something that we're going to need to make our decision on shortly um again it's a good problem to have that the state took care of the unsuitable soil situation so that we can do our best to take care of what our educators are, are desiring for Birch Grove. But again, I'll keep you guys in the loop as to when that walkthrough will be because they, they definitely want to have the, the BOA do a, do a safe walkthrough. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, who else um, at the um, curriculum, Jacob? Yeah, I'll give a quick update. We um, had a special meeting uh, earlier today and we discussed a few things. A big topic of discussion was just pandemic considerations. Um, we discussed with Dr. Willett how right now a lot of the kind of changing of the curriculum that regularly happens is kind of postponed and a lot of the focus is mainly trying to convert it um, so that it can be uh, taught with the current um, situation with hybrid learning or remote learning. Also, we did discuss a little bit about having the other curriculum supervisors for math and science um, come to some board meetings and um, I'll probably send an email to you and Dr. Willett about um, maybe trying to have um, Mark Rudy and uh, Jen Webster um, speak at a regular board meeting like uh, Ms. Uh, Daly Burns did uh, earlier in this meeting. That's it. Am I forgetting anybody else at this time? Uh, the negotiations too. I don't know, Rini. I don't know how that you can say anything about that or not because I know it's kind of. You could just say it's going. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much, we we sort of covered it already. We're we're negotiating. We're in negotiations with the pairs, and you know we've got dates scheduled. We've had a couple meetings, and we're and that's ongoing. Okay. Uh, Plord, you had your hand up. Uh, I didn't have communication communications meet. Um, but I did instead attend a webinar on the board's role uh, in communications with the district. Uh, so I will politely and respectfully ask you um, to allow me to stay on as chair. I'd be happy to have a co-chair if that's allowed, but I'd, I'd like to stay in that position. Okay. Okay, let's, um, anyone else, am I forgetting anything? So we did. FFC didn't not meet, correct, as I met prior. Just making sure I'm not forgetting anyone. Okay. Uh, chairperson report. So I just wrote up something really quick. Um, the holidays are around the corner. And with that being said, that also indicates that tonight will be my last official meeting uh, that I'll be running until after my maternity leave. I'm gonna be taking time to bond with our newest addition to our family. Um, I'll leave the board in good hands with the interim chair of Christina Plord. Um, I do still plan on reviewing all the Board of Ed materials and trying to attend the leadership. I have a hard time putting work down at the same time. Um, so I do wish everyone that, I mean, obviously budget season is coming up. So Dr. Willett, I'll get in touch with Jen because the packets better still be coming. <laughs> because I still need to review and see exactly what's happening. Um, I obviously I'm not gonna fall behind on the budget materials. Um, it's been a long road and the next meeting the ninth, I will be in the hospital. So <laughs> I will not be here. <laughs> and I just wanna wish everyone a good holiday season because um, I 
like I said, you know, Thanksgiving, holiday, whatever, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever you guys celebrate. I just want to make sure that everyone stays healthy, happy and healthy. And uh, that's it. So let's go on to um, board action, the 2021 BOE meeting dates. Ashley, Stana, I just wanted to say something and good luck to you. And I feel like you and your husband may have conspired to have this baby during budget season purposefully. <laughs> But uh, safe and happy holidays too, as well. And good luck and congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it yeah. went by quick, and uh, it's already here. And I kind of looked at the schedule, and I said, "Oh, this is my last meeting for a little bit." And I'm not going anywhere. I'm just going to take a little bit of time because I'm sure I'm going to need uh, to stay up through these meetings. I'm going to need to build myself up a little bit back up. Um, Madhu, just also wanted to say congratulations and. You know, it's very exciting news and happy holidays and I hope everything goes well. Thank you. Okay, let's move to the uh, board action of the 2021 BOE dates. So this is fairly straightforward. It is the, it is what the board has already seen. These are your, uh, you know, these are your dates moving forward. You may recall that you had uh, moved the time already um, that the time or, or that the time was on there to we moved to seven o'clock for those dates. So this is generally done by the board every year to set its forward dates. And this is about the time of year you do it. Okay. This is um, essentially the second read and therefore we can have the uh, entertain a motion to approve for the 2021 meeting dates. Jacob Mari, I move that we approve the slate for 2021 meeting date. Christina Ford, second. Oh my goodness, three oh, of shoot. So Lisa. <laughs> I'll rock, paper, scissors, you Christina. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and then discussion, did anyone have anything to say about the date? If not, okay, let's do the roll call vote. Uh, board. Aye. Jacob? Aye. Do? Aye. Rini? Aye. Tony? Aye. Griffin? Aye. Sophia? Aye. Dana? Aye. Um, I as well. Therefore, the um, dates for the 2021 mini dates are now approved as is and with no changes. Okay, let's move to the public participation. There is a um, two minute time limit. Tony will be the timer and let you know when you have 30 seconds left if you could please state your name and address and at this point the public participation needs to be limited to items on the agenda okay uh liz hi everyone um first of all i'd like to thank mrs daly burns um as a parent of students that have gone two through 12 and k through 10 in our system i would really say that our english department is top notch and has seen marked improvement in the last two years especially since the arrival of Mrs. Daly Burns. Um, as a senior parent now, but a junior parent last spring, I appreciated that our students' teachers then and their current English teacher now presented reading and summer reading that really presented ideas that are appropriate for our world today, and especially with intent for better cultural emotional learning and discussion amongst peers. These readings have elicited tremendous discussions pertinent to both the readings and also current events. Secondly, I might suggest that you allow an opportunity to ask students a pertinent question as one of two student reps tonight uh, said that many students were anxious in our school systems and they didn't feel safe in school. I would hope that in the future that would have been elicited a question from all of you, at the very least a show of concern. I'm disappointed that the, uh, there was no show of concern or a lack of questions. Mrs. Lund Lundgren, I'm wondering if you will consider reappointing the chairs to recognize the minority party representation in the committee chairs once the two new members decide and perhaps other members switch as well. I would love to ask that as a starting point that perhaps board members refrain from long prepared statements to actually listen, perhaps use bullets instead of long prepared statements. And finally, Mrs. Lundgren, I hope you would have proceeded as Mrs. Plore did tonight with the start of a bright future versus rehashing the last meeting. While you address some of the, several, of, several of the previous board's members' comments, I will remind you that many of the items you brought up tonight were also mentioned by the 
public as points of difference. I've commended you when you've improved the meetings, but today I thought you could have started anew. Congratulations to you and your new family and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And I believe you did say your address, correct? Probably not, but you've got a C4 design line. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? Michelle Harold, 194 Sugar Hill Road. Um, I'm disappointed that there was no discussion about how we, how the Board of Ed could share leadership and include minority um, representation, especially in the leadership meetings where there seems to be a lack of communication and it's resulted in a lack of cohesion as the group of the group and a lot of divisiveness. And there was no discussion about how to make that better. I also take issue with your mis misrepresentation of the insufficient technology that you stated, you talked about in your statement. Um, former Board of Education did support one-to-one -one technology, but we were unable to afford it. We were able to get one-to-one -one in 2019 for sixth graders only, and that was, we were told that it was a grand plan, even though it was only one grade. And then in the spring of this year, with um, unspent funds from uh, the pandemic, um, you had an opportunity as presented by Dr. Willett to fund one-to-one -one technology for K through 12 and you didn't do it. So I take issue that you're trying to like push blame onto others and not take accountability for your actions. And I hope that we can all just do better and move on. And I don't feel like what has happened and transpired over the last several weeks has made a difference at all with this board. But I hope that you guys can come together and discuss this. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Jada? Thank you. Um, Ashley, congratulations. I, I wasn't aware. Uh, congratulations to you. Um, I just want to make sure I heard Alexandra, and I'm, I'm glad Liz just brought it back up. Um, Alexandra said something at the beginning of this meeting that it's, Ashley, you, you just, as soon as she said it, you went to a complete different uh, topic. Although it was an important topic, it was completely ignored. Um, and I I'm a former student, so I don't know how current students feel, uh, but that kind of seems like a problem. Um, so I'm going to leave that there. Secondly, uh, Mr. Mari, to your point on the necessity for bipartisanship on the Board of Education, I think everyone can make that statement, but in all honesty, not everyone may mean it. We all agree that we want to see more bipartisanship, my brother, but the problem is, and for everyone watching, I need you to hear me, really hear me here, uh, Mr. Mari, the problem is your side, and I hate to put it that way, because as Kenny, uh, as Kenny always says, we're, we're all neighbors, uh, but your side refuses to acknowledge the, not just the minority on the board, but the majority in town. You can go all the way back to the debate over educational cost sharing funds and how they'd be spent, and the fact that not a majority even, uh, 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 I won't even go further into that. Uh, whether it was the consistent defensive nature of leadership or the, the attacks from one board member uh, to another on social media, it's been boldly clear which of the neighbors sitting on the board have proven their partisanship rather than bipartisanship. I don't say this to be rude or mean or whatever adjective you'd like to use on social media, but I say it because it's about time things change uh, instead of, as Michelle just said, or Liz said, rehashing the past. Um, not only so our su superintendent can properly do his job without any under any extra duress than he already is, yes. Uh, but also so the kids in town can be the ones that benefit from your terms in office, not not you all. So thank you. Have a good night. Happy holidays. Jane Registered, 68 Old Stafford Road. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Summer? Um, so I just wanted to go off what Alexandra also said. Me and her had discussed this before, and I just have like a couple of questions regarding COVID. So um, I know this period goes till December 2nd, but with um, Thanksgiving coming up, I know a lot of my friends are traveling. So there is obviously gonna be a spike. So I just wanted to know, like, are we after Thanksgiving break, are we gonna be, you know, all in person again? Or are we, what's like the future plan? Because obviously cases are going to rise. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, that one, Summer is definitely one for Dr. Willett. I know that he's uh, definitely doing the calls again for contact tracing. Yeah. And so that one, he would definitely be able to help you in terms of that. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, do you want to do respond? Yeah, here? that was it for the uh, public participation. So we can go to a uh, piece of information. Okay. Okay. So, you know, Simmer, I, I completely understand your concern. Um, 
you know, what, what I'm doing is I'm appealing to, um, can you guys hear me? First of all, I don't want to start. I, sometimes I'm talking for like five minutes and then I don't realize. Um, so I'm appealing, you know, we're, I'm appealing to parent guardians and families uh, to work with us as a team. Um, you know, going, uh, going completely remote, um, you know, right after a, a period of time like Thanksgiving or, um, or even a December school holiday. The problem is that, um, you know, uh, the, the more perilous place for most people right now is in the community. The community has far more spread. Um, we're still at a 0.6, you know, we're less than 1% for any positive COVID identifications. So one of the safest place, uh, places for students is, is within the schools for the hours of the day that they're there and the more hours a day that they're there, the better. Um, and so, you know, generally that helps keep prevalence lower and keep students safer. Statistically, that's, that's been happening that way. Um, so, you know, if we were to, to put people back in the community, say, um, that, you know, after the holiday break, uh, families don't have many options. Um, they will probably be, you know, uh, sharing uh, resources. People will be over at other people's houses. Um, there's more community interaction. Uh, less control and less oversight, less management, less screening. Um, so being all being out actually uh, tends to create more of the spread than actually having students within the schools um, getting educated, getting supported, that kind of thing. I know it doesn't intuitively feel that way, but um, but it's it's really coming out that way when we look at you know the trending and the information. The other piece of it is that I'm really relying on the partnership with families. So. You know, if families are going to be traveling to states that are that are red, um, meaning the travel advisory, uh, basically the whole United States at this point. If you look at the Connecticut's travel advisory, you know, I'm relying on the ethics and morality of of us as a team, both school and community. And I'm asking families, you know, if you're in a situation where you are traveling and you are going to be with other groups of people, you know, submit it to the COVID form, um, fill out the exception form, and and stay home for those two weeks. If that is what you're doing, please do that. And I, I have faith in the community. I, I have faith in that partnership that the people of Tolland um, have that ethic, you know, ethic and moral fortitude that they will do um, what's right by people and they will do those, those you know, exception forms in quarantine themselves um, or fill out the COVID form and have the travel quarantine. Either that or follow through and get tested for the negative PCR in return. Um, so I'm confident in the community that they'll work with us. And by doing that, those students that need to be quarantined because of the rules will be those who can come back and avail themselves of the, you know, the services will, and we'll be able to, you know, keep that going for everybody that needs it. Because when people aren't in school, there are a lot of, a lot of downsides to that for families, for students individually. Um, so that's what I'm trying to mitigate, but I am relying on the community as partners and, and I do think they're going to come through. Thank you so much. Sure. Great question. And thank you. And Simmer and I and Alex, uh, like Alexandra and I have talked a bit about this too before. So I, I value their opinions deeply and we've met on it and they're some of the most, they're, you know, obviously the most important stakeholders. Um, so uh, thank you, Simmer, for bringing it up here too. Let's go to Plord. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, I just wanted to address Liz's comment and our student reps. I, I did have it written down on my agenda to talk about our student reps' concerns uh, with safety at our COVID meeting on Friday. Um, and I looked at my agenda. I thought we would have a COVID update every, every meeting, but it didn't make it this week. Um, so I apologize for that uh, because I do think it's an important uh, piece to talk about uh, in regards to the anxiety that people feel. Um, it's, it's a tough situation to be in. Um, I'll echo what Dr. Willett just said about, you know, having the in-school option and the remote option. Uh, a data point I read uh, this past week, uh, the hybrid model, you know, when kids aren't in school, 56% uh, of the kids that were sick were in the hybrid model and the rest were kind of um, in person and then remote uh, being the lowest, but the hybrid model, you know, the kids are getting it out in the community. Uh, so I'll 
you know, agree with Dr. Willett on his decision to um, keep the kids in school as safely as possible, uh, but definitely something to be discussed on Friday uh, at our meeting uh, with the stakeholders. So um, I know that probably doesn't alleviate your concerns, but um, we are listening and, and thinking about you guys and, and working hard to keep you guys safe. Let's go to Tony. I guess question for Dr. Willett. Last last budget season, we had the uh, the forms and the charts for questions uh, that could the, the board members and the public could submit, could then get prioritized and answered when there was time available. Uh, one, are we going to do that again? And two, could we open those up? Uh, early so that we could start getting the questions in and getting them prioritized yeah yeah i was uh i was going to have the that kind of released at the first meeting uh in this case it's now november 30th but um you know i can do that i think the board one has been active i think it's it's always on the dashboard and it stays active but the community one um is out there i think it's it's also out there too on the website we just haven't seen a whole lot of them but i'll point people in those directions when we are on the 30th. Um, and I can certainly put that in the uh, bulletin as well. All right, thank you, sir. And for um, our newest members, I just wanted to say the dashboard is definitely something that takes time to understand and find all the information, but ask questions because you, you may not find stuff. <laughs> I had a really hard time getting used to the dashboard. No offense, Dr. Willett, but there's just a lot of information on there. So make sure you ask questions. <laughs> yeah, when we have our first meeting together, uh, I'll go over all of those, uh, those pieces too. Okay, perfect. Um, Griffin? Um, I just wanted to kind of address some of the comments about the board kind of as a whole. Um, personally, I felt this meeting was really productive and I'm hoping that Sophia and Madhu felt the same. Um, I'm not really sure why the public is kind of saying, over and over that there's still this big division. Um, I personally didn't feel it and I sincerely apologize if I came across as being anything but you know wanting to work together. Um, I can assure you that I'm not feeling this animosity or I don't know, whatever you wanna call it um, on the board, especially, you know, with our new members. So um, I'm looking forward to working together and I hope that we can show the public that we can and we can do it, you know, politely and respectfully and uh, share our ideas and our thoughts. And I thought everybody had some great questions and comments tonight. So uh, that's all I wanted to say that I'm looking forward to, I guess, proving to the public that um, we're, we're, we're in good shape. So thank you. Okay, uh, Jacob. Okay, so just in response to uh, Mr. Registered's comments, um, I'll, I think my position has always kind of been that disagreement is okay. In fact, I think it's pretty healthy to have some disagreement. Um, it's a good sign of a healthy democracy that we have different ideas and that they're all competing against each other. Um, the key though to not just bipartisanship, but just good governance is kind of attacking the idea, but not the person that holds the idea. Um, I won't claim that I've perfectly stuck to that. I don't think anyone has, but um, it's something I've tried to do um, on my time at the board. And trust me, since you get quite a lot thrown at you, um, it's something that becomes all the more relevant. Um, second, I want to congratulate Ashley. Um, I hope that the first few weeks she has with her new baby are, uh, um, enjoyable and she gets a little bit of a nice break from the Board of Ed. Um, and I'd also want to congratulate uh, Madhu and uh, Sophia. I don't think I've formally done that, but um, it was really nice having you up on this meeting. Um, and I hope that we can work together well. And finally, um, just in response to uh, Simmer and Alexandra's report, um, sorry I didn't make any comments up on that. Uh, it's a really tough issue. Um, doesn't have a whole lot of easy answers to it, um, to be honest, which is one reason why I'm very excited about this mental health task force. Hopefully this can provide us with some long-term 
answers to this problem, but it, it certainly is a difficult one. Um, and uh, whatever information you can give us, uh, the better. Okay, um, Madhu. Um, so I, I guess first I just wanted to start off by saying, um, you know, I'm looking forward to a reset and working all together in a bipartisan fashion. And I hope we can accomplish this and show the public that we can work together. Um, the second thing is I had two questions for Dr. Willett, um, or I guess maybe suggestions. Um, I know in part of like dealing with the anxiety of students is, you know, is would it be possible to send out like a monthly or whenever you're getting ready to make the decision about, um, you know, if we're going to do partial in person, like, you know, hybrid, you know, what have you, would it be worth it to send a questionnaire to parents and see what the response of the community is? And the second part would be, um, you know, when we get the COVID updates um, about the, the numbers in quarantine, I think it would be helpful if we had the numbers, the, the cumulative numbers that are currently in quarantine, as opposed to just new numbers, you know, I, I, just, just a thought. So, um, so I'm looking for ways to, to provide the best you know, uh, possible information and, and most extensive. The blog has quite a bit of uh, information on there, particularly about, you know, the Connecticut School Indicators, our area, that kind of thing. I definitely can, and, and I'm looking for ways to, to provide uh, data that helps uh, kind of process. For instance, you know, we are at a, a, late, a rate of less than 1% of COVID positives in our, amongst our students and staff. We're at about a 0.6. Um, so out of 2,700 people, we, we're still in that range of like maybe 15, 16, but part of that is students who have never set foot in the building too. So I'm trying to figure out ways to report because we'll report out on people that are remote that, uh, that really haven't had any contact, but they're still, you know, in, in enrolled, they're still students. And there's even staff who have never really been part of the building or in the building and, and also are, are positive. So it's a, it's a kind of, Dr. Will, you're doing it again. Yeah, you're cutting in and out. Um, sorry. Um, there we go. It sounds like it's better. Better. Um, sorry. Yeah. Let's see. Is that is that better at all too? Maybe? Yep. Yep. That's better. Much better. Okay. I'm just getting rid of this thing. Um, Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know where, where I cut in, where I cut out, but um, I'm looking for the best possible ways to provide the most meaningful statistics. Uh, you know, I do put stuff on the superintendent's blog that has uh, things from the Connecticut School Indicators. Um, you know, we, we're at a, a prevalence rate in district of about 0.6, less than 1%. So out of the, you know, 2,305 kids and out of the 414 staff, even if you subtract 300 or so remote in that range, um, you know, we're still at a 0.6 or less than 1% of COVID positive prevalence. Um, you know, so part of it is uh, that even within those numbers, let's say with your, you know, 10 to 15 people that posit, you know, would be positive, amongst those are people that have never set put, foot in the building at all. Some of them right. are, you know, remote. And so trying to find the best way to do that and give a sense of, you know, of, of how that dynamic is actually affecting us you know, I'm looking for the best ways to keep doing that. So I, I will, I'll keep thinking about that and putting it in. What I can say is that over the span of the months that we've been in right now, you know, we're at that 0.6, um, less than 1% of, of our entire population has been COVID positive. And most of the identifications that I see on a day-to-day -day basis as we work hard to do contact tracing in partnership with EHHD, um, they're, not, they're not from within school incidents. They're often things that are going on outside you know, circumstances of people visiting family and that affecting people and quarantining. So one of the most important things that I'd love to you know, try to reiterate with people is the number of people quarantining does not at all, it is not really at all an indicator of how dangerous things are. It's really an indication of how proactive we are being. You know, when you're seeing those quarantines and you're seeing those active communications, you know, the human beings generally, you know, the heuristics, you know, our, our neural heuristics are, to look at it as an incident and see one right after the other and, and become somewhat fearful of that. 
But really what it represents is us being extremely proactive and aggressive and making sure we isolate. And uh, you know, we're doing that. Um, we're keeping everybody, you know, it, it, we're working very hard to keep people safe. And uh, we're, keeping, we're keeping kids in school by doing that, which keeps them safe in a, in a myriad of other ways and supports families in a myriad of other ways. Right. So if that starts to shift, we'll definitely make changes. But, you know, we really are in a place where after, you know, three months of school, we're still below 1% of people that have been tested COVID positive. And in that group are still people that were remote and really haven't been in the building at all. So, you know, our stats are very, very good, but I know it doesn't feel like that. And the minute they aren't, I will, I will never recommend having a four day in if I felt like that was different. So I thank you. I, I will look at... Um, ways of uh, continuing to communicate and improve the, the way that I, uh, you know, that I uh, reach out in that. Okay, and, and just one other thing, do you think it'd be worth it to have a survey go out to parents, like, you know, to kind of help and make your, inform your decision of, of what it is that we're gonna end up doing? It just seems like, you know, it, it seems like that would be a, a valuable thing to have. Sure, I, um, yep. I understand. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to Sophia. I just want to echo um, what Mr. Mari said about the mental health task force. He has an excellent point in that um, it is very exciting that our town is putting this together. And I hope through its outreach, they tap into our school system because the children's anxiety or any mental health issues affect their learning. And I hope that they, the task force takes a holistic approach with families, with whatever is implemented. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe that was everyone. Um, let's go to future. Um, Dr. Willett, was there any items that you wanted to touch base on or just, cause I mean, we definitely have a long growing list of items. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, we, we know what most of the ongoing items are. I, I'm not sure how we, you know, we didn't quite get them in there, but you know, we, uh, you know, we are going to continue our work, uh, culturally responsive education. And uh, you know, again, I'd like to set up some of the uh, instructional rounds that uh, I think the board has appreciated and enjoyed in the past. It helps give perspective, especially as we enter budget season. Um, and then you know, the typical things that you're seeing already, uh, the curriculum, bringing the curriculum supervisors in, and um, you know, and continuing to work in ways to find uh, you know efficiencies and regional opportunities wherever they they present themselves. So, you know, these are all on the radar. Things we're working hard to do, um, and we'll keep uh, we'll keep throwing them up there for the board. Uh, even throughout this pandemic year, we'll we'll make some instructional rounds, for instance, happen. You know, uh, I think they're great for budget. I think the board likes them too. Okay, perfect. Um, at this point, I would um, entertain a motion for adjournment. Jacob Mari, I move that we adjourn the November 18th regular Board of Education at 1037 p.m. Madhu Renduchantala, second. And I don't think there's going to be any discussion, so let's do the roll call. Uh, Plord. Aye. Jacob? Aye. Madhu? Aye. Rini? Aye. Tony? Aye. Griffin? Aye. Sophia? Aye. Dana? Aye. I'm um, aye as well. Therefore, we will adjourn at 1038. Have a good night, everybody, and I will see you at some point. <laughs> 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 <laughs>